please rise for our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free And the the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever before. Freedom and the individual have been more available than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high. We have never been unwilling to pay that price. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great things, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. We are Americans. <laughs> Father, we come before you. God, we ask you to take this day. You created it. You established it. And Lord, I know that we're a people that have been gathered together who love this country. Not everyone in this room are watching. We understand that. But Father, we pray right now that the reality of who you are, the grandeur of this nation that you gave us, and the fact that you're alive gives us ultimate hope. We've talked a lot about this last week regarding the things that are valuable to us. And we must admit that these things that we hold dear are things that you have always been. Righteousness, freedom, liberty, love, kindness, forgiveness, grace, mercy, salvation. Well, Father, we give you this time and we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said... Amen. Now you can be seated. God bless you guys. It's great to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> you, you guys want to shout it? On the count of three, it's Merry Christmas, right? They're already starting it over here. I want to hear it loud. We're not going to let the culture rob us of shouting Christmas, right? One, two, three. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown, for sure. Amazing. So we look at our nation and all that's going on around us, and we must remember hearing all week the fact that this nation has been founded in a way that no other country on earth can boast. 
Obviously, there's the correlation with the United States and Israel. You open up the Bible and you see that God called Israel out of slavery, that he established them upon his word, the Bible, and that all the way through, whenever God wanted to bring his people back, he brought them back to the Bible, back to the word of God. We saw in the days of Nehemiah, when Israel had been taken captive, that they returned to the word. We saw that with Ezra, they returned to the word. Every time we see a reawakening, it's the returning to the word of God. Friends, listen, I know in this is that there may be somebody who will say, I love this country, but not, not the God that you talk about. And that's okay. I want you to hear something. The God that I represent today is the God that the Bible says is all creator. And that the Bible says he is love. That he is grace. That he is forgiveness. But that he is holy. And this is why what you and I are standing for matters. Now look, I'm a pastor, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm allowed to say what I'm about to say. Woke pastors need to either change their biblical worldview or go look for another job. You either turn it up or you need to get out. Now, all means, we need to get back to the Bible, back to the Word of God again. And you say, well, what makes you say that? This nation's history makes Listen, when we talk about our founding fathers, we need to understand that when we read our founding fathers, they talk about their founding fathers. Did you know that? Listen, Adams, Jefferson, Washington talked about the founding fathers. You say, Jack, wait a minute. I thought those founding fathers. They are our founding fathers. But when they were beginning this nation, they leaned back upon the pilgrim experience. Look, just a couple weeks ago, we celebrated Thanksgiving. Did you realize that in 2021, we celebrated the 400th Thanksgiving service that had been conducted in America 400 years ago? 400 years ago. And this is what's awesome. This is what's glorious about it. That when the Mayflower pulled up before they got off that ship... William Bradford and the gang, half of them believers, half of them not, they said, we're not getting off this ship until we have a governing body of laws. And they crafted what is called the Mayflower Compact. Now, if I was the dictator of education in America, nobody would go from school unless they had memorized the Mayflower Compact. Very big, it's not very difficult. But I can tell you right there, for those who are saying, America is not founded upon God, man, you need to read some history. And oh, by the way, I don't know if it was Tucker, if it was, I know, Charlie, but listen, this whole thing about the 1619 project, you got to, listen, that is so dumb. It is so dumb because why stop at 1619? Why don't you go back to 1605 when Reverend Hunt came to this country to this continent and preach the gospel when he landed in what was parts of Virginia or would be Virginia. 1605, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, 1619. 1619, that was a focus on a bunch of people who came here for reasons and not for God reasons. And most of it failed until you get to the 1620 landing of the pilgrims. And why did they succeed? Everybody, you need to know this. I think you do. I'm just saying it anyway. In 1620 is when they came because it was rooted in faith. It wasn't rooted in anything else. And so how do you know that? The Mayflower says this. It says right there that we have come in the name of our King and our God to this continent to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in the Mayflower Compact. And to back that up, everybody, in Plymouth, Massachusetts, there is a massive pillar, and that pillar, which nobody rarely ever stops to see, is the Founders Monument. And it's all a way around labeled by the characteristics and attributes of what makes a great nation. And this is what they believed. They believe that this is what makes a great nation, that you're educated. From education dispels barbarous acts if you're educated. 
that you should be merciful to one another, that you should love each other, because with that you can establish a country based upon laws, that there's a, there's a God in heaven that we live and conduct our lives understanding that he's holy and we're not. That that is to be that God's word would be the guiding light. You just heard that tape played again, that audio again, again. And you know, everybody says, oh, Reagan said that this, we need to make this nation a city on the shining hill. Listen, John Winthrop said that. Reagan knew that. And Reagan quoted John Winthrop, who was the first governor of the Pilgrim Colony. Founded upon the word of God. Now look, you don't have to become a follower of this country. That's how amazing our founders were. They knew the Lord, but what they did is that they created a nation where even the atheists would have the freedom to exercise their atheism. That's how much freedom we've got. It's amazing. But we look around, and listen everybody, it's been referenced, look, I'm, I'm, it's the last day. I don't have much to say. You guys have already heard it all. And I'm telling you though right now, that what we've been hearing, it will be a crime if we leave this facility and we do not determine to put into practice what we've been learning this week. We have got to do it. Charlie mentioned on the opening day, Charlie mentioned something that I wonder uh, if you got it. And believe it or not, it was probably one of the most powerful things said. He said, you need to run for school board. You need to run for PTA. You need to know how much power you can have in those entities because like many have said, politics is local. Oh, and one word about politics. See, aren't you a pastor? You shouldn't talk about politics. Let me put it to you this way. The Bible says that God invented government in the book of Leviticus. He invented government. It's repeated in the book of Exodus. Throughout the Bible, God is the giver you know what happens to government when man takes control of it without seeking God? He makes it into politics. Man makes the politics. God has established the government. Government is where you and I have enjoyed for 400 years a nation that we had the freedom to worship, we had the freedom and the prosperity and the education to not only be blessing one another, but to bless the entire world. Ladies and gentlemen, we all, if you live in Arizona, I live in Southern California, obviously, a border state. Listen, here's the deal. I was down at the border with federal agents, and I asked an agent, how many people do you have to deal with that are breaking into me? He said, you mean California? And I said, no. How many people do you have to deal with that are breaking into Mexico from California? And he said, man, I don't understand your question. He said, oh, I get it, I get it. Nobody. Breaking into Mexico from California. This country is still the greatest hope on earth. As messed up as it is, it's still the greatest hope. People are breaking into this country because hope is what the Bible talks about. Listen, King David, when he saw that his nation was falling apart in Psalm 11, he cried out and he said, you're asking me to fountain of the Lord. He said, what am I to do? And what shall the righteous do when the foundations are removed? Our nation's foundations have been shaken by those who do not believe in our constitution. They do not believe in the God of the Bible. They do not believe in individual responsibilities or freedoms. And they've imposed, make no mistake about it, they have imposed their deity upon us. Their deity is tyranny. Their deity is made up of a bunch of little demigods that they call the shots. A, a, a handful of those who are the power brokers. And I want you to know something. Jesus called that Nicolaitans. If you're familiar with your Bible, just the works of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Jesus said that. And the word Nicolaitans means those that lord over the people. God wants you to connect with him personally. God wants this nation, there's still hope for this nation to turn back. And listen, I got to tell you, I love our military. I love this nation from a Marine. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, 
I'd fight for this country right now. I'm old, but I'd, I, I'm going to go down swinging. But I got to tell you this, everybody. I got to tell you this. It's the, the strength is not in the military. The strength is not in the White House. The strength is not in the State House. The strength is in God. When we, we see God, He will respond. And let's all, let's all agree right now that we're in a desperate moment of time. This is the first time in human history that what's going on in the world is happening to the world at the exact same time. We need to wake up and realize something's up. Didn't Tucker say it the other day when... Yes! He said it's spiritual. He hit the nail on the head. You guys know uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, author of Lord of the Rings? How did the Lord of the Rings uh, come about in Tolkien's mind? Tolkien saw World War I, and Tolkien, being a soldier, said to himself, there is no way this can be happening in warring with man. There's got to be demon invisible forces that are behind man killing man. And he invented, he gave us the Lord of the Rings. I got news for you. Tucker was exactly right. The issue is spiritual. But I'm going to differ with Tucker. And I, I don't know him. I hope he's not here. Uh, don't tell him I said this. But, uh, look, I'm sure you love Montana like everybody else loves Montana. But uh, he, he was encouraging you to go build a cabin somewhere. I'm, in, I'm inviting you to move to California and put on your battle gear. You need to come. Come, come fight. We, don't go. Listen, don't, don't run to some place. Go get a house if you want. Fine. Come and that's what Charlie's all about. Listen, I know that I'm old enough to be Charlie's dad, but I got to tell you, I pray for the strength of Charlie Kirk to be a player joined hip on making the knowledgeable of his freedoms are and that God in heaven his freedoms. And you guys, check this out. I got a few moments left. So David looked around and he said, what is the righteous to do when the foundations are removed? Our foundations are being removed. We're being attacked. What do we do? You do the same thing that David did and that all of us have done from the ages. When everything looks impossible, you turn and you look up and you say, God, look down from heaven and have mercy. God, have mercy upon us. Listen, friends, our nation... California specifically now has sanctioned abortion. Our governor is saying, I fear the overturn of Roe v. Wade. And so I sense that that's coming. This is Newsom. He senses that the Roe v. Wade ruling is going to be overturned, that abortion is going to be abolished. So he's doubling down and he is announcing to America that California will be your abortion destination state. Guess what we're doing? Dear God in heaven, either save Gavin Newsom or give us a new governor. But by all means, please don't let that happen. When the foundations are shaken, maybe in life your foundations have been shaken. I thank God for, listen, I know it sounds crazy, man, but I thank God for there's... A lot of people in California that have not bowed the knee to Fauci. I mean, uh, have not bowed the knee to fear. We understand it's flu season. Happens every year. Here's the deal. When we are told by politics, not government, you can't gather, you can't sing out loud. Isn't that funny? You can't sing out loud. You can't. You can't gather together. Listen, the more I read my Bible and read my Bible, the more I understood, if that's what I'm hearing from politics, then it's time to obey God rather than man. It's time for us to do the right thing. And so for us today, your life, there's no doubt in a room this size that you've lost someone this last year. It's, it's possible you've known somebody who died from COVID, cancer, Heart attacks, old age, we all have. But what about you? The moment we hear about death, isn't it, a isn't it amazing? Everybody's afraid of death. 
all of a sudden in the whole world. You're not allowed to get sick. Nobody's allowed to die. Wear a mask. Wrap yourself in bubble wrap. And stay home. You can't get sick. Why? Because you could die. Well, we're all going to die. The point is to the gospel is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would him would not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, we're all, we're all going to we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Here's the deal. You got to get ready before you die. Jesus said if somebody dies believe it forever. Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the father but through me. Isn't that narrow? Yeah, that's so narrow. You bet it's narrow. Son died once on the cross, never to die there again, to make a way of salvation for you. It's free. It cost him everything. But it's free to you. So the number one thing about turning back America is that we get on our knees. That's how we fight. Do we run for office? Absolutely. Do we vote knowing the candidates? Absolutely. Always look at their voting records. Never listen to them. Listen, never listen to candidates when they... Don't listen to them. Their voting records. Their voting records never lie. They'll lie through their teeth. But their voting record never lies. So you, you vote smart. You pray. You get involved. Because here's, here's what you do at the end of the day. Number one, you make sure that when all this is over, someday it's all going to be done. You're going to come to the end of your life or the end of your moment. And you're going to want to make sure that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. Evangelism, you being a good person, ain't going to cut it. If you could be good enough to get to heaven, then why did Jesus die on the cross? Listen, he, he died for jerks like me. He died for sinners like me. It's, it's him. And listen, you want your soul secure because you rise from that and you go forward doing the right thing. Well, you guys in California, you just had a, the largest recall in American history against your governor. That's right. But you wound up losing. Listen, it was the biggest recall in American history. It was awesome. Here's the deal. Would we like to have won? Yes. But here's the deal. We stood for what's right. And at the end of time, we get to look God in the face and say we did what's right. And listen, I, I invite you to say yes to Jesus Christ. He's our only hope. He's enough. He's all that you need. And when the foundations are shaken, he'll stand strong. God bless you guys. How's everybody doing? It is a great time to be an American. I'm Corey DeAngelis. I'm from the American Federation for Children. And it's also a great time to be a school choice advocate. The teachers unions have finally overplayed their hand, showed their true colors, and in a way, inadvertently done more to advance the concept of homeschooling, parental rights, and educational freedom than anyone could have ever imagined. We should give everybody uh, a round of applause for, applause for Randy Weingarten for us out this year. School Choice's inadvertent advocate figured out that there isn't any good reason to fund a failing, closed government institution and students directly instead. This year has been. What up, America Fest? It's John Root. You know Turning Point USA wouldn't be where it's at today if it wasn't for your incredible support. Whether you're the boots on the ground at woke schools or standing up to cancel culture online, there's always a way to show your support. You can take our mission to the next level today by going to tpusa.com slash donate. Because of you, we can put on parties like this, fight woke culture, and conserve American values for the future. What are you waiting for? Donate today.
conservatives and dude conservatives. I'm Alex Clark, host of Politics and the Spillover. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. Look, what Turning Point does for campuses around the country is so important, and it's only Here's some conservatee. Coming January 2022, we are taking education to the next level with Turning Point Academy. This is major. Get your phone out right now and text Get Involved, all one word, to 7 1776 and get all the details on how you can join the fight. Again, text Get Involved, all one word, to 7 1776 to join the fight. You have to ask the question, how is the most heavily funded tribe have the poorest population? Listen to me. Uh -huh. My country is because everything problem here. Don't have petroleum for bush and Cuban, for car, for life, yeah. for nothing. And it sucks. Socialism sucks. There's no other way you can describe it. Hello, America Fest. This is Jack Posobiec, once again, the host of Human Events on the Turning Point Live Network. Now, one of the main questions that I get every day is, Jack, how do I get involved? I want to be part of this fight for Western civilization, this fight for traditional values. What do I do? Well, the first thing I say is, are you married? The second thing I say is, are you going to the gym? thing I say is once you've done all of that and you still want to do more politically, it's simple. You've got to get involved with Turning Point USA. This is the organization that is leading the fight, leading the charge against the woke social justice left that is trying to take over our country. So what do you do? If you want to get involved, we actually have set up a brand new text message for this. You text get involved, all one word, to 7 all one word to 71776, and a member of our team will reach out today. I'll see you out there. How much does the earth we should fund students directly, not the system. Anybody heard of the, the National Association? I mean, before this year, it's like no one really knew what it was. It's like, why does the National School Board Association even exist in the first place? But it turns out that there's been pushback here, too, on the part of parents. It, it's a good idea to label parents as domestic terrorists for pushing back at the school board meetings. And since they put out that statement to the Biden administration, essentially labeling and suggesting that some parents should be labeled as domestic terrorists, 18 states have already voted to defund the National School Board Association. Parents are taking their power back, and it can happen at the state and local level. We're seeing that with the National School Board Association. I mean, at this point, can we even call it the National School Board Association? 18 states have already left. They've lost already over 42% of their state-level funding. Maybe we'll call it the Regional School Board Association or something at this point, because at, at, at this point, uh, people are understanding that it doesn't make any sense. So let's Continue. Join us in the fight to fund students, not systems. You can go to the educationfreedompledge.com or for short, if you want to go to edfreedompledge.com. Uh, help us join the fight to fund students, not systems at the American Federation for Children. Thank you guys so much. Have fun. America is the greatest country that we have ever seen. I was able to receive information that we do not live in a racist country. I get so sick and tired of being sick and tired of these idiotic people. You should have an ounce of respect for anybody claiming Black Lives Matter at this point when they don't give a flying fear about black police officers, they don't care about black conservatives, they lie to you and tell you what you want to hear, and then you buy in and they switch it up. That's the problem with tyranny. <laughs> Cause y'all know how I do. Come on. get your get your get your uh, blood flowing. And let me tell you why I do this. Every time I speak, people say, "Why do you want us to stand and do the little chant?" It's because I believe in the Bible, 
And I believe that the power of life and death is in your tongue. In the beginning, God said, light. we are made in God's image and likeness. We have power in the things that we say. All right? So don't embarrass your family on TV and let's get this right. I want you to yell, I win when I point at you. I want you to say it like you mean it. All right? We're going to do a test run. When I count to three, say I win. All right? One, two, three. I win. Come on. Come on. Y'all can do better than that. One, two, three. I win. All right. I'm going to say a phrase and then I'm going to point at you and you know what to do. All right? At school. I win. In life. I win. In the name of Jesus. I win. All right. Y'all, y'all own it. Y'all own it. Against these haters. I win. Again. I win. And again. I win. And again. I win. In the end. I win. All right. Y'all can sit down. Y'all can sit down. Go ahead and sit down. I think y'all ready to go now. Y'all are ready to go. Let me give you the key to success. This is the one thing that I can tell you. It may cost you a million dollars to you for free today. One key to success. The only thing that you need to know in order to accomplish the dreams that you have, to be the person that God has made you to be, is to put God first in everything you do. Put God first in everything you do. Everything that I have accomplished, who I am, who some of you believe that I am. I've seen a lot of you, some of you had tears in your eyes saying you changed my life. All of that is because I put God first. All that you will achieve in life, all of your aspirations and dreams, that thing that's sitting right there in your heart telling you to go for it. To fire all odds. Telling you to stop worrying about what your parents say about you and you go for it. Some of y'all are questioning whether or not you should drop out of school and pursue your passion. Maybe that's you. That thing that's burning on the inside. Some of y'all need to go back to school. Some of you need to pursue your dreams in school. Some of you guys may want to start a YouTube channel like B. Tatum. But before you do any of that, make sure you have God first. Now, I believe that my life is a testimony to the things that I say. I wasn't always like this. And I say this a lot of times when I speak, people don't recognize me, wouldn't recognize me if they knew who I was before this. I had a bad attitude. If you say the wrong thing to me, we'll fight. I, had young, I got young savage tattooed across my stomach. If my six-pack game was, was all right, on point, I'll show y'all. But my, my wife been making meals, and, you know, hey, I don't want y'all to see that side of me. But I used to have gold teeth in my mouth. I got my hood tattooed on my forearm. And it took God to revolutionize who I was and change me in 2008 when I got saved. How many people are here saved? I was racist. I was racist. Now I look back on it. We used to have a disdain when I was growing up for white people. We thought white people hated us. And that I had to work four or five or six times harder than the white man to achieve. I used to believe that police officers were racist white people that just pulled over black people for no reason. I used to believe that crap. I used to believe all of it. I'm passionate about the things I say today is because I used to be that guy. I used to be that person. And when I make these videos, I'm Quit being lazy. Quit making excuses. You can be anything you want to be in this country if you work hard. And they tell this big lie about our country and our founding. I believe that the Constitution was inspired through these men by God. The problem was, and it's just like the Bible today, is whether or not we applaud the things that were written. People say the Constitution ain't for the black man. The Constitution, nowhere in the Constitution where it says white, whites only. I see nowhere in the Pledge of Allegiance where it says whites only. 
It don't exist. The only problem we struggle with in our country, I think we struggle with in our faith sometimes, is actually applying what was written. He didn't want to take, he didn't want to take away the Constitution of the United States of America. He didn't want to eradicate it. He didn't want to get rid of it. He wanted us to live up to it. Live up to the promises that we made. Don't let these folks lie to you. There's no division amongst us. We're all one. We're all the children of God. Don't let them lie to you. We've been working together since the very beginning. We've been working together since the very beginning. What do you think Harriet Tubman was doing? She was going to La La Land, having these black people go with her to La La Land, some mysterious place. No, there were white people who worked with her, risked their lives so that black people could be free. When the vote to free black people in this country of slavery, give them citizenship and the right to, to have a vote, those things were voted on by white people. I don't know how they missed that. We, we didn't have a right to vote. How are we going to vote on our right to vote? But there were good white people, and they, won't, they don't want you to believe it, there were good white people who never believed that anybody should be a slave. They understood the purpose that we had in our country. Another myth that eats me alive sometimes is the myth that police officers and the police department around the country are systemically racist. It's a lie. It is a lie. I was a police officer in the state of Arizona in Tucson. We have any Tucsonians in here? Oh, Y'all represent for a little town. I, I see you. But I was a police officer in Tucson. Never met a racist cop. Not one time. I met some lazy ones. I met some ugly ones. <laughs> but I never met a racist cop. All the men and women that I went to the briefing and debriefing with, we loved one another. We would die for one another. And it wasn't just words. It's not just words. That's the problem today. People just talk. It's lip service. We literally went out every day and put our lives on the line for one another in real life. And I had one guy be racist towards me. He, I went on a call. He was a, he was a, say he was a white supremacist. He couldn't whoop me if we had a fight, so I don't know what, what his white supremacy would do for him. <laughs> but uh, I go to the call. He says, I don't want a black man taking my case report. Before I could even open my mouth, my partner got on his real fast. Real fast. I thought I was going to have to break him up. I thought he was going to fight the guy. That, to me, tells me that the majority of us will never accept hatred and racism. Does it exist in America? Yeah, some fools in a cornfield somewhere running around in circles. That's probably the extent of racism in America to me, in my opinion. It has no power. And, and let me tell you this. It's a phrase that I use. Um, I made a shirt with a, with a title on it because I believe it's an invaluable concept. I don't believe in white privilege. I believe in Christ privilege. Why do you say that, Mr. Tatum? Because there ain't a single racist, white man system, whatever you want to call it, that can stop what God has already planned in your life. It doesn't matter what color you are. Police officers interact with about 300 million people a year, and only 1,000 result in the death of somebody. You could do the math. I'm not a mathematician. 100 million and 1,000, that's some, that's some numbers I can't even calculate. The computer may put an E on it. Right, same as COVID. <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't say it, YouTube. Don't ban me. So, but it's a, it's a myth that they're out here just killing black men and they're out here just thugging. It's not true. I was on the SWAT team. You, you rarely get into a deadly force situation as a police officer. I know police officers go their whole career. Anybody. How, have I had to put my gun on people? Yes. Have I had to put the hands on people? Yes. Have I had to chase people? I caught everybody. Except one guy. <laughs> one dude. Only reason I didn't catch him, I had my rifle in my hand. And he had some skinny jeans on. He was gone. 
I was like, God dang. Ho hope nobody got this on camera. But anyway, the message today is for you to be inspired. You guys have, I mean, this is the coldest event that I've ever been to. Y'all agree? Charlie Kirk, man, he, he younger than me, and he doing it big. Greatest event. I love coming to the because I see America at these events. I see people of all races, all backgrounds, all ages, all dispositions, whatever you name it, I see them. And we are all together. These people who hate us, these lunatics on the left, because hey, they don't have happiness. They can't do an event like this. Because the first black man to show up on their event going to be crying about oppression and slavery. And, and a thousand years ago, black men were, stop all that crap. Stop all that crap. You guys should be empowered to do great things. Be empowered. Be inspired. Have some passion about what you do in life. I don't care what your background is. I didn't come from a perfect background. My parents weren't perfect. My life story wasn't perfect. I got kicked out of school when I was a senior trying to fight a teacher. I threw a chair at her. She, was, she messed up that time. I got arrested when I was eight years old smoking marijuana in a vacant house with my cousins. My life wasn't perfect. I did a whole bunch of stuff I regret. But that don't stop you from taking advantage of the 24 hours of the city. And I hope that when you leave here, you leave here a different person than the person you came here as. I hope that you've been meeting people, you've been connecting with people that live in your state, outside of your state, people you would normally talk to. I'm hoping that you're connecting because when you go back Wherever you go to school, wherever you live, that's infiltrated with these brain dead people, that you have a friend to reach out to. That you've met a new friend to replace these fake people. I want you to understand this. And I know a lot of y'all have lost friends, quote unquote. Y'all have lost family members. Screw them, right? If, if they are not paying your bills, if they don't put food on your table, if they're not taking your test for you, which I hope they're not, they're already excluded because they can't. But if they're not doing those things for you, what do you need them for? Let them go on and cry in the corner. Find some new friends. Everybody that I went to school with just about, when I came out and I said I supported Trump, I'll tell you where you can get it at the, at, at the end of the speech, all right? Hey, it's capitalism, all right? It's capitalism. I lost, I lost all of my childhood buddies. They called me a sellout, Uncle Tom Coon, bootlicker. Some of it is funny. They had a little raccoon doing this on the thing. I was like, I'm laughing at my own demise. No, but college friends, I played football at the U of A with, called me an Oreo. Can you believe that? They called me an Oreo. A guy, a guy I went to church with called me an Oreo. I like, boy, I know you ain't saved. You, got, you need to get baptized again. I'll never forget this lady in my church. Sister, Sister C was in the military. She was my dog. We were, the, we were the two types at our church. I remember Sister C messaged me uh, right after I had made the little video, and she go, um, you ain't nothing but an end just like the rest of us. And I said, dang, I didn't know Sister Seal even cussed. Sister Seal tripping. But despite all of that, or in spite of all of that, God gave me a whole bunch of new friends. God gave me a whole bunch of good people. God gave me a beautiful wife. Where my wife at? She probably in the back. Yeah, I don't want y'all to see her anyway. Don't be trying to take my wife. Where's she at? Where's she at? She over there? Hey, baby. You fine, girl. You fine. I can say that because I'm married, all right? We married.
But anyway, I want you guys to leave with, with, with power and encouragement. Hopefully the things that I've said have impacted you. Um, hopefully the things that you've heard from everyone up here, take that in, absorb that. Let it change your life. And last thing I will say is that this life ain't about you. Why do I come on this stage? It ain't just about me. I can sit at the house and do these videos. And my videos get 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 views. It's because it's, it's about you. I want God to use me to help you. And God is calling you to use what you heard here to help other people. Right? I don't remember nothing else I said. When times get tough, things go astray. Remember, it's not about you. The things that happen to you, and I, I go back in history, the things that happen to the slaves, people don't want to say this, but be Tatum, keep it real. The things that happen to the slaves in this country were for me. They went through it so I could have life. And so black people can have life here in America. And it was a tough road. But God, through them, an opportunity that we should be grateful for. That's all I got to say. We should be grateful. I'm glad I live in America. I hate they had to go through it, but I'm glad I live in America. I hate that Christ had to die on the cross, but I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm going to start preaching. Where the, where the offering pray at? Pass the offering around. It ain't about you. When I get discouraged, and I say, man, I'm tired of this, boy. I'm tired of these people on social media. These people that follow me sometimes. I'll be wanting to turn it all off. And I say, it ain't about me. How am I going to get so worked up? How am I going to get so emotional about my friends when Jesus died? It wasn't a figurative death. It wasn't an illusion. He got beat. He took it. And he wasn't even wrong. He didn't do nothing wrong. He was telling the truth. Just like y'all telling the truth. And they didn't want to hear it. Just like they don't want to hear it. But you know what? He said, I don't care. 30 years old, he had a long life. He said, it's time for me to, to take this punishment for everybody else. Every time they hit him. Have you ever got a whooping before? Raise your hand if you got a whooping. Oh, it was way worse than that whooping. Y'all got my, See, my daddy should stay right here when he whooped me. They were whooping him all up here. Every time he got whooped, he ripped us. Okay, I got, I got to keep going. I got to keep striving. I got a whole bunch of people depending on me. I got a whole bunch of people looking, looking to be saved. I'm taking these whoopings. Same thing with you. Every time they come at you, Every time they try to hurt you, you say, no, I got a, I got a nation to save. I got a nation to save. And if my Savior could do it, I could do it. And y'all can look at it. I get the most hate probably out of anybody in this room. And if I can do it, you can do it. God has called each and every one of you guys. To do something. You have a purpose. I'm living mine. My purpose is to speak, encourage, to be a light. I had to go through a lot to get here. A purpose. Don't just look at the stage of people up here and think, oh, that's so awesome, man. I would love one day to be there. God got something for you. It may be to be up here. Five years ago, I never thought I'd be up here. Six, seven years ago, I never thought I, I wouldn't be a police officer. You would be crazy. I went back to get my master's degree a chief. I would never, I would, I would never thought I'd be up here, but God has a plan for you. Your measurement of success ain't me or anybody else. It's the person in the mirror. Are you doing what God called you to do? Have you made the commitment yet? Are you living your purpose? Because your purpose is just as valuable as mine. I'm not here if it's not, if it wasn't for you. You understand that each person have a legacy of people. And this is what I believe in my heart. Influence. There are certain people in this world that will not receive influence, will not receive God, will not receive the truth, but for you. God is the person of passage. And if you don't do what God has called you to do, those people may not hear the truth. You have a realm of influence. You never know 
if you were waking up Brandon Tatum, you never know. One person can make such an impact. All right? I love you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. God bless you. God bless America. And enjoy the rest of this event. Oh! Hold up. Don't get me off yet. Don't get me off yet. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm like, I'm like a comedy guy. Got the music. Now, if you want to connect with me, if you want this shirt, if you want these shoes, no, I'm just playing. If you want the shirt, text Tatum. Y'all put it on the screen or something. Text Tatum to 5445. Tatum to 53445. Connect with me. I will send you out the information, give you a discount, all of that. If you are here and you're done listening to all the incredible speakers after me, come see me at my booth, booth 525. I'll take a picture with you. I'll sign a book, whatever you need. I love you guys. Thank you for having me, and y'all have a blessed day. We knew that the second term of President Donald J. Trump would make the first America Fest is John Root, host of Live in the Breakaway Podcast. I thought Bill's Mafia, the Cameron Crazies, and the Raiders Black Hole were the wildest and best fans, but I think conservatives got them beat. If you're not involved with TPUSA yet, get off the sidelines and get in the game. Text get involved, all one word, to 71776. You can start or join a chapter, learn about upcoming opportunities, and so much more. Text get involved, once again, all one word, to 71776. What up, cute conservatives and dude conservatives? I'm Alex Clark, host of Politics and the Spillover. I am so excited to be all of you today. Look, what Turning Point does for campuses around the country is certain, and it's only getting bigger. Here's some conservative tea. Coming January 2022, we are taking education to the next with Turning Point Academy. This is major. Get your phone out right now and text get involved, all one word, to 7 1776 and get all the details on how you can join the fight. Again, text get involved, all one word, to 7 1776 to join the fight. <laughs> Buddy, for those of you now from Arizona, welcome to Arizona. How are we treating you out here? All right. You got to love the freedom out here. And for all of our Arizonans, thank you for showing up. Uh, we appreciate it. This is an honor to be here. Uh, let's give a hand to Turning Point again. What an awesome event, right? I am honored to lead this panel right now. We've got uh, three American patriots, warriors. Uh, these are men who have signed on the dotted line, served their country with honor, and uh, it's an honor to be here with them today to have this conversation. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. Right here we got Chad Wright. He is a backwoods Neil, wizard, hermit, 
He is the man. <laughs> I do have pants on, by the way. <laughs> he's got the, pan, the, the ranger panties going on. They got the, don't tread on me if you've seen him. So. Well, you know, Sheriff, a few months ago I ran 38 hours straight in these shorts, and they're very special to me. And I figure if they were good enough for that, they were good enough for the people here at Turner. Amen. USA, so. Amen. And that's one thing I didn't mention, ultra marathon runner. So give it a hand for Chad Wright again. We've got a ranger right here. Rangers lead the way, right? Actually, we have two of them. We've got Ryan Kleckner. He's an author, ranger, a sniper, and uh, the list could go on and on. But thank you for being here with us today. And then if you don't know John down at the end, also a ranger and uh, a true American. I got a chance to talk to him a little bit yesterday. An honor to have him as well. Um, we're going to jump into this conversation because you don't want to hear from me. We're going we're gonna to hear from these guys. Um, one thing we're dealing with in law enforcement, and I know that this is probably the case in the military as well, we're seeing a rise of, these guys probably don't know the term wokeism or woke because they live in a whole different warrior world than we do. Uh, but we're seeing that liberal wokeism out in the, in, across this country. I wanted to ask you guys, and I'll start with you, John, because I know you've got some opinions on this. What does... How is that liberal wokeism affecting the military and the people coming into the military, the ranks of the military? Uh, great question. It's devastating in numerous ways. Uh, one is I think it steals the hearts of soldiers. I mean, a soldier is supposed to be ready to die in defense of their country. But if, if pervasive wokeism ideology convinces them that our country is evil, that we're all white supremacist, xenophobic, land stealing fascists. Why in the world are in that? You know, I, it really, if you're defending entry, that makes you evil. And so, why in the world would the soldier die of country? And so, it literally erodes the whole foundation of what a soldier is supposed to do. We can't survive that. Another thing that uh, this leftism does to the military. Uh, is it's just going to get people killed. It is. We a shameful retreat from Afghanistan. And it literally, I know, yeah. And it's literally cost the lives of innocent people. Some of those Americans, some of them innocent Afghans, suffering under uh, tyrannical terrorism. It's costing people's lives. And it's also a signal to the rest of the world that America is weak and vulnerable. You, surely you guys have seen and gearing up, and Russia, China gearing up, they're not playing woke gender games. They're getting ready to take over and dominate, and that should alarm us. Stop. This is going to literally get people killed. It already is. Uh, and the third thing is what this wokeism is doing is it's eviscerating with a mass evacuation of the special operations community. That's our community. We're, we're former special operations soldiers, all of us. Uh, and here's a fact for you. I know a grand total of zero operations, guys. Zero. They don't exist. And, and, and it's to be in that community that we're connected to requires a certain level of down-to-earth realism, also a, a certain amount of intelligence, uh, pragmatism, uh, and uh, resilience to bullying. You can't believe. And so when this left this comes out, it's simple. It's kind of like, and then they just get out. I've gotten so many resumes from SEALs and Rangers and Special Forces guys that want to come work with the Warrior Poet Society doing training or, or doing some of our content. I get resumes all the time because they refuse to bad ideology and they're getting run out of the military. That's what's happening. Thank you. I was so busy trying to get Chad's intro right, I forgot about the Warrior Post Society. So, uh, Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I agree with John. I, the, the reason we did was not because we were paid. It was because we believed in something. We repeatedly volunteered. We volunteered for the military in the first place. Then you volunteer for maybe various schools or various unit assignments. And there's something to be said for why we did that. It's because we believed in the country. We believed in the flag. I mean, I still do. I don't mean to make it sound that way. But I, there was a, never the magic that I felt when I was in this, saluting the flag and knowing just that, that the swelling of pride I had within me. 
And when you're overseas, when you're deployed, I deployed a couple times to Afghanistan about your time. 2001, I was in Afghanistan, right? There's something to be said about that girl back home for the soldier. There's something to be said about that family back home that you know you're protecting or there for. And when we really tell these guys and women that what they're fighting for isn't worth fighting for, what do we think? Great point. Chad? Yeah, great point. Guys, let me add just something onto that. These woke agendas are actionable in the circles of special operations communities. Let me tell you what we used to do with vaccines when I was a SEAL operator. We'd walk into the medical office. Do you want this vaccine? We said yes or no. If we said no, no in the trash can, and we'd sign the paperwork. This crap is freaking laughable to me, man. That's how we look, man. Come on. And let me tell you what, China, Russia, Iran, they can do whatever they want because I am still convinced that we, the people of America, have the strongest, most dedicated, most capable, most highly trained operators on the face of the freaking earth, man. So tell them to bring it, son. They got nothing on us. Bring it. Look, that's where we're at. Let me tell you the problem with these agendas. When you're in combat, you got to deal, deal with problems within the boundaries of reality. You have to accept reality in combat. You have to accept the situation for what it is, man. And let me tell you, when you ask me to say that a man can be a woman or, or, or all this crap, when you ask me to do that, you know what you're asking me to do? You're asking me to partake in an alternate reality. You're, that's what you're doing. You're asking me to partake in an alternate reality that is, is, is not possible in terms of human biology or the laws of nature. Negative. There is an all-out war on your perspective of reality. And we have a large percentage of our population that are living in an alternate reality. If you can convince me to say that people of the same sex can produce a child, what else can you convince me to say? You can convince me to say whatever you wanted me to say. It's about reality, man. We have to return to reality. What is real? What is real? Send it, son. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, that was amazing. send it. That's what I'm talking about. I love it. We asked back there if we could do a mic drop. We had to catch it if we drop it, but that was a mic drop. And you know what? On top of Backwoods, Navy SEAL, uh, Wizard, Hermit, Reverend, Chad Wright, right? That was fired awesome. up, man. I love my country, man. I love I'm it. Fired I love up. It too. And you know, I love you guys. Chad brings up a good point. What is our resolve as Americans? to fight for what we love, which is the freedom that we, that these men have fought, whose friends have died for freedom we have. And uh, it's an honor to listen to these guys. The passion they have for America should be the passion that you leave this, this conference with, a, a renewed passion. Um, I just wanted to say one quick thing on bad, you know, cause I want to get into leadership. But one thing I saw was them leaving Afghanistan. You may not think it has an effect here in America, but I'm going to tell you, as a sheriff who deals with border security every day, when we sent a message to the world that we were too weak to hold our ground in Afghanistan, who do you think is going to, that's not going to stop them from coming to this country illegally, especially those who would wish harm on our country. Now, I want, we talk, I've been saying that the good men and women of law enforcement, and they probably won't raise their hand because cops never do. But I know out here we got some cops here today. Thank you, guys. And I always say, the cops are not the ones that didn't hold the line. The police officers out there on the streets are holding the line. Who didn't hold the line? The administrators of this profession. There's a lack of leadership in this country of people with the fortitude to stand up for what is right and to stand up for the men and women who put it on the badge. So I want to talk to you about leadership in the military. We, we talked a little bit about the wokeism. And I want to talk, we'll start with uh, Ryan this time. 
what is the leadership and how do you see this being an issue in the military? Well, I think I see where some of the problem is coming from. When we have leaders like General Miley and people like this that are advancing this woke culture. Agreed. They're the ones that are leading the charge on this wokeness in the military that needs to stop. And I think the reason is, where do they come from? I mean, I've, I've gone to college since, so uh, don't hate me. But when I was in the military, I was enlisted. I didn't go to college first. To be an officer, you have to go to college. And these officers that are in charge are sometimes going to these liberal institutions, and they're learning this liberal ideology through college. And the more advanced degrees they have, arguably the more liberal college they go to, sometimes they're promoted better in the military. So we have, liberals figured it out. I'm they beat us to it 30, 40 years ago by getting into the colleges first. And so when you have General Miley there, he has the mindset in college. He doesn't have the mindset starting from being out there in the field like us. And until we get leaders out there that know what it's actually like to be on the ground, know what it's like to be one of the, the bottom guys first, I don't know if we're going to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Reverend? Hold up just a minute. Let's quit calling these things liberal ideologies and let's start calling them what they are. It's freaking evil, man. Evil is the problem. There's this weird thing on earth. It's this intangible force that we can't see. But it's there whether you know it or not. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, men like us have seen it. And it is called evil. Right? All right? And that's what it is. It's not a liberal ideology. We have to change the way we're talking about these things. All right? There, you can't negotiate with evil. Evil ain't going to listen to you. You can't make terms with evil. You know what you have to do with evil? You have to freaking drive it back into the shadows. That's what you do with evil. Screw these people, man. Amen. Battle of good. John. Uh, so love what my brother's up here saying, but can I get one big round of applause for Chad's legs? You guys see these things? Booyah. Stand up again. Chad. Booyah. Up one more time. Look at it. Turn around. Turn around. <laughs> it's the only sexy thing on my body. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm I like, love what Chad's saying. I, I hear about 95%, but the other 5% of me is just looking at his legs and just be like. Thank you, John. Bro. Bro. You knew we were speaking today, too. You're just kind of like, I'm going to wear these shorts. <laughs> I'm surprised you can't see him dropping out the shorts. <laughs> oh, we're getting way off topic now. We got to reel this hey, conversation to back be said. in. Now, let's back on leadership. To be said. You can't just not say something about that, you know? Very good. Uh, returning to leadership. Listen, the way the world works, it just rises and falls on leadership. That's just the way it is. Chad, Chad mentioned he believes that the United States has the most elite fighting force that breathes freedom and is ready to live and die defending her. And I believe that's true. I believe that is uh, the common soldier. I believe that's true with law enforcement as well, the good cops out there. That's absolutely true. Uh, though I, I maintain that's true, the weak leader would make it to no real advantage. Uh, and, and so we have to make sure we have strong leadership. Uh, Alexander the Great, if you don't know him, he took over the world by, by 33 years old. Quite impressive. So he knows something about fighting. And he certainly knew something about leadership, something amazing about leadership. And he said this. He said he didn't fear an army of lions by a, a sheep. Uh, but he did fear an army of sheep led by a lion. Let that sink in. We cannot survive being led by sheep. We can't do it. We have to have strong leadership. And we, the American people, soldiers, or soldiers, cops, we have to demand strong leadership. And if we don't get it, we must get them out. We have to. We cannot survive weak leadership. Whether it's the White House 
or whether it's in the top ranks of our military, we cannot survive it and we cannot change it until we demand better because we do deserve it and freedom necessitates it. Excellent, excellent. And you know, this year is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to send a rebuking and send real leaders who want to represent America first. And I think that's important. Um, we got a lot of folks out here. Some may have served in the military, may be active, some may be uh, law enforcement. How can these people, I'm going to start with you, Chad, give them some principles that they can implement that will bring out that America, that warrior within each and, with, inside each and every one of them today? Oh, are y'all ready for this, son? <laughs> Do you guys really want to be warriors? Do you want to do what warriors do? A little story. You guys have been hanging out in this conference for the last week. And you've got all this motivation. And you've got all these tools. You've got all these ideas. And you've got all these things in your head, right? That you know need to happen. In the SEAL teams, I was a breacher. And as a breacher, it was my job to build a bomb so that I could blow a hole in the target building so that my team could get in and crush our enemy. And every time we would get a target package come down, I would go back into the ready room and I would build a bomb. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I can remember walking up to the target building. I was the first person in the patrol. And I would take this bomb out of my pack and I would peel the hydrogel off of off the back of it and I would stick it to the wall. And I would cap my blasting caps in and I would pay my deck cord back to minimum safe distance, right? And I would look behind me. And guess what I would see behind me? I would see a bunch of sets of green eyes because it was dark outside and we owned the night I'd see a bunch of sets of green eyes and it was my team that was lined up behind me and they were waiting for me to hear three words and you want a tip you want to know what warriors do best you know what you want to know what you need to do when you leave here you need to be thinking about these three words I was waiting for on every target I ever went on as a breacher, standing by with my entire team behind me. Those three words are execute, execute, execute. And that is what warriors do. Warriors execute, execute, execute. And if you let this knowledge, if you let this motivation, if you let these ideas die, and you don't execute, execute, Execute? Guess what? You're not just cheating yourself. You're being selfish and you're cheating your entire nation. And you're, in che you're cheating generations that will follow you. Generations that are following you are waiting for you to execute. 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 Just like every single warrior does on the battlefield. And that's what you all need to do when you leave here. When you wake up tomorrow morning, there needs to be three things going through your head. As a matter of fact, go ahead and put it in your alarm on your phone so that when that thing goes off in the morning, you look at your phone and your phone tells you to execute, execute, execute. Amen, brother. That's what warriors do. That's what sets us apart. You don't need no vaccine. We just need a little bit of Chad's blood in each and every one of us, right? <laughs> We'd be all, we, they, we, they, America would be just fine. Chad, I want that as a ringtone. Will you, <laughs> I will buy that on the app store. Execute, execute, When my alarm execute. goes off, it's your voice. Yeah. Just screaming, execute at me. I love it, brother. Got to do it. It's the essential ingredient. It is the essential ingredient. And that is why we are failing right now. It's because got, people won't freaking execute, man. We got apathetic. We got too lazy, and now it's the time to execute, to work. John, party, give, us some, uh, give us some advice. Give these guys some warrior advice. <laughs> I'm sorry you got to follow Chad, but... <laughs> uh, I don't understand. Phrase the question again. 
He just looked at me. He's we like, got, we got God. A room, we got a room full of good Americans here. How do they implement a warrior lifestyle every day? How do they, how do they tap into that, each and every one of them? Uh, it's been said that uh, a great author, love him, named G.K. Chesterton, he says the soldier uh, doesn't fight because uh, he hates what's in front of him. It's because he loves what's behind him. I think that's so critical. And so where I, I, I want to echo, yes, execute, execute, execute. I think the thing that grounds me to be fearless, because that's what, that's what keeps us from executing, right? It's fear, or, or we just don't know what in the world to do, right? But a lot of times it's fear that paralyzes us. Uh, we don't have, we want to have that awkward conversation, or what if I put myself out there and there's consequences, and uh, I lose my job, or I lose friends, or it's an awkward family uh, meal or something like that, or we're just debilitated by fear. Uh, but when I think about the people that I love, uh, when I think about the ideals that mean the most to me, the things that are worth living for and dying for, and that's God, that's family, that, that's country, that's everything we stand for. When I think about that stuff, uh, Jesus says, um, perfect love casts out all fear. Well, he said, First John, uh, perfect love casts out all fear. Um, that, that's the thing that moves us, right? And, and so w when I'm motivated by love and when I'm thinking about those high ideals, that's the, I think that's the way that we stoke up that courage to master uh, that fear. And, and so my encouragement to you guys is this. Don't let fear steal your life anymore. You're good people. You're good people. God love you for it. Way to go. Uh, but part of that means we're kind of okay to just not make a scene and, and be real respectful while the left just wreaks absolute chaos like petulant children screaming, picketing, whining until they get their way and we're just kind of seeding the field. It's kind of like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to compete with crazy. I'm like, no, we can't afford to give an inch more ground. You've got to go on the offense. You gotta have those hard conversations. You can't let fear paralyze you anymore. And though uh, you're not flipping down nods and kicking in doors and blowing, uh, blowing uh, buildings apart like we used to do, you are still engaging in the war of ideas. And right now, we're not in a civil war that we're trying to kill countrymen. God forbid we ever get to that. Please, please God protect us from that horrible, horrible state. But as it is now, we're in the war of ideas, and you've got to go on the offense. It's not just us. We're not going to be able to do it for you. It's every person in this room going on the offense in the war of ideas. We still be loving. We still be respectful. But we call a spade a spade. And when someone issues this leftist garbage horse crap, you're willing to immediately say, that is horse crap. Absolutely not. I do not believe in that. Thank you, John. Uh, and, and I want to say... John, beautiful, beautiful point. I want to add to that. That offense starts with your family and your local community. That is where that starts. So if you don't have the capacity to run for some congressman or woman or president or whatever, it starts in your family and in your local community, okay? Uh. Family is the smallest form of government. So everyone in here can make a difference. Everyone in here can execute. Everyone in here can do what John just encouraged you to do. Don't feel like you're, you're out of that, of, you, like you don't have the capacity to serve in that manner. All right? I just thank you. Family God. unity is one of the strengths of America. Ryan, we're running out of you a little bit of time, but I want to at least save 30 seconds for these guys, too, to, to let these get folks know where they can follow them, what you want, your, your, your websites, podcasts, all that. So, I would say take care of yourself first before you take care of others. It might sound selfish, but I mean it like the gas mask on an airplane. You've got to be around and you've got to be alive. You have to be educated before you can mentor others. So spiritually, go to mentally, educate yourself what the topics are. Take care of yourself physically. You don't have to run for 38 hours straight like Chad does, but you should be in shape, right? And I ask you to consider moving and taking action before you know exactly what you're doing. You can't steer a parked car. It has to be moving before you can make some direction, right? I like to look at life and anything that I've done. 
everything I've done that's worked out, I started, and people ask me how I did it later, I go, I figured it out as I went. I look at life like going through hills and valleys out in the woods. I'm out there with a map maybe, or I'm land navigating, I'm trying to figure out the way to go. Well, sometimes I'm down at the bottom between the mountains, and all I see is the trees around me, and I can't see the peaks of the hills very well, and I don't know where to go. Well, sometimes the best way to know where to go is to get up on that hilltop. So that takes effort, that takes moving, that takes walking, even though I don't know it's the right. And that sometimes in life when I'm up on those hilltops and I can look back and I can see where I came and I can see where I'm going for me to remember what that terrain looked like because pretty soon I'm going to be back down again and not see anymore. But I've got to keep on charging and just move now, figure it out as you go later. Amen. Move, move. All right, Ryan. Tell, uh, tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find your book, and then just give me one sentence to sum up what America means to you. Oh, my goodness. Where you can find, that's a tough one. Yeah. I might go after John. Good luck. Last sentence. I have no idea what I'm going to say We've got to do no, this in like 20 so, seconds. <laughs> all right. Uh, you can find me at gununiversity.com. I do myriad projects online with guns, and, and I do them with John. I write books. I write the long-range shooting handbook and stuff like that, but gununiversity.com is where it's at. Go find everything. Thank you. Chad, where can they find you? Tell me what America Yeah, guys, 37project.com. The most important thing I can tell you before you leave here today is read your freaking Bible and give your heart to Jesus. That's what drives oh, me. Second Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen, brother. Yeah, I, we're all Christians up here. Isn't that great? Praise God. That's fantastic. I'll echo uh, that as well. Uh, John Lovell, Warrior Poet Society. We live for higher purpose. We're ready to sacrifice in the defense of others. That's what Warrior Poet is. And if, you, if that resonates with you, follow Warrior Poet Society on YouTube. All kinds of videos join our movement. Warrior Poet Society on Instagram, Facebook, and also a streaming service with shows. Warrior Poet Society. Uh, Let's give these guys another hand. Booyah. This is Jack Posobiec, once again, the host of Human Events Daily here on the Turning Point Live Network. Now, one of the main questions that I get every day is, Jack, how do I get involved? I want to be part of this fight for Western this fight for traditional values. What do I do? Well, the first thing I say is, are you married? The second thing I say is, are you going to the gym? But the third thing I say is, once you've done all of that and you still want to do more politically, it's simple. You've got to get involved with Turning Point USA. This is the organization that is leading the fight, leading the charge against the woke social justice left that is trying to take over our country. So what do you do? If you want to get involved, we actually have set up a brand new text message for this. You text get involved, all one word, to 717. Get involved, all one word, to 71776, and a member of our team will reach out today. I'll see you out there. How much does the earth cost? I'm going to buy the entire earth. What up, America Fest? It's John Root. You know Turning Point USA wouldn't be where it's at today if it wasn't for your incredible support. Whether you're the boots on the ground at woke schools or standing up to cancel culture online, there's always a way to show your support. You can take our mission to the next level today by going to tpusa.com slash donate. Because of you, we can put on parties like this, fight woke culture, and conserve American values for the future. What are you waiting for? Donate today.
What up, conservatives and dude conservatives? I'm Alex Clark, host of Politics and the Spillover. I am so excited to be here with all of you today. Look, what turning point does around the country is so important and bigger. Here's some conservatee. Coming January 2022, we are taking education to the next level with Turning Point Academy. This is major. Get your phone out right now and text "Get Involved" all one word to 7-1776 and get all the details on how you can join the fight. Again, text "Get Involved" all one word to 1776 to join the fight. You have to ask the question, how is the most heavily funded tribe have the poorest population? Listen to me. Uh -huh. My country is very sh** because everything problem here. Don't have petroleum for bush and Cuban, for car, for life, yeah. for nothing. And it sucks. Socialism sucks. There's no other way you can describe it. Hello, America Fest. This is Jack Posobiec once again, the host of Human Events Daily here on the Turning Point Live Network. Now, one of the main questions that I get every day is, Jack, how do I get involved? I want to be part of this fight for Western civilization, this fight for traditional values. What do I do? Well, the first thing I say is, are you married? The second thing I say is, are you going to the gym? But the third thing I say is, once you've done all of that and you still want to do more politically, it's simple. You've got to get involved with Turning Point USA. This is the organization that is leading the fight, leading the charge against the woke social justice left that is trying to take over our country. So what do you do? If you want to get involved, we actually have set up text message for this. You text get involved, all one word, to 71776. Get involved, all one word, 71776. And a member of our team will reach out to you. I'll see you out there. These people need to learn to fear us because we, the people, are the ones who hold us in power. The incompetence of the Biden White House cost American lives. Mr. President, listen carefully, and I'll say it slowly just for you. No man left behind. That's leadership. When it comes to the matter of protecting our friends, our family, and our heartland, do not trifle with this representative democracy. For we the people will not stop. We will never back down. We will give out everything to protect those dear to us. This, this, is, our country. this is our republic. Finish the wall. We are going to be the party that is known to fight. When I say that if you think this bastardization of the Constitution will be met with silence, then you know nothing of the America I know. You want my guns. I know it. We all know it. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have to say thank you. You gave me a great ramp. I was like, if they put a jump here, we could have gone straight into the crowd. So first and foremost, get the most important thing out of the way. We all need to thank our Lord and Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for letting us all be here today. Number two, we need to recognize that I have been called a, a nationalist in the mainstream media. I, I've been called somebody who cares only about America and focuses on, on this nation. Uh, the rest of the world be damned. And I have to say that you're absolutely right. So, one, I'd like to get uh, some political matters out of the way. So, obviously, I believe conservatives are poised to take over this country very, very soon. Uh, I'm going to have control soon. I, I, I believe that. And so I want to talk about what we have that control, and then I want to speak about really the most important part of what we all can do as Americans, as this next generation, as the leaders of this country to be able to save the country. So number one, when we take power, I think first and foremost, our number one priority should be prosecuting Anthony Fauci for lying to Congress and putting him in Well, I believe that we, the, uh, really, the 
greatest thing in this country is the Communist Chinese Party. Uh, really, their, their ability to infiltrate our world, to infiltrate our country, to influence things on the global stage. I believe, especially all of us in this room who are under 40 years old, they will be the enemy that we will be facing uh, for the rest of the century. I genuinely believe that. So, because of their terrible mishandling of COVID-19, allowing it to be released from their country, I believe that we should seize all Chinese assets in the United States of America as a down payment for what they owe us. Next, I genuinely believe that we need to launch some investigations when we take command. Uh, one, I want to figure out exactly why the NIH is torturing puppies in Africa. Uh, number two, I want to understand why we are funding gain-of-function research. Uh, number three, I would like to investigate President Joe Biden for... If, if, if you think about what happened, he does not. And I, 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 I'll tell you. None of us in this room, I think, should take any joy in watching the cognitive decline of, of the President of the United States of America. Uh, but I, I will tell you, I am so frustrated with Dr. Jill Biden, his wife, to force a man who is obviously going into cognitive mental decline to stand up against people who are going into the prime. To where I, I just wanted to call him, you know, happy Uncle Joe was the Vice President one day. He could sail off into the sunset. But no, now we have to go against him. And when he disobeyed direct orders from the Supreme Court of the United States and did an unconstitutional action. My friends, that's an impeachable offense. So, so next, I, I really want to talk about, and th those are some political things that I think we all can do. That's uh, some things I think we can all get behind and advocate for as Americans. But as we are going into really the, the, the rest of this decade, the rest of 2020, I, I really feel like the 1920s set the tone for all of the 20th century. A lot of the things that happened, you saw all these revolutions with socialism, saw all these revolutions with communism all across the country, and I think it was because of the terrible economic upheaval that, start, that we saw in the 1920s. Well, that's what we're going through today, uh, in the world today. And I think that we have, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that the world does not go in the direction that it went after the 1920s, uh, does not go into the direction of heading to a world war, does not go into the direction of terrible where people are saying, no, let's give all the, 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 the means of production over to the government, because that's a great idea. The government's never messed anything up. And I, I would love for them to run my health care, give them the empathy of the IRS and the efficiency of the DMV. It'd be fantastic. Gosh, if anybody here has been to the DMV recently, I just want to pray for you. It's, it's, it's so much worse after, after 2020. Uh, but I'll tell you, the number one way that I think we all can save this country, because I believe that we all genuinely love this country, is by embracing the America First doctrine, by embracing you know, the MAGA doctrine that Donald Trump started. And when people say that Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party, I, I say, I think he started a revolution in this country where now we are the leaders of the conservative movement. We all are the leaders who are going to determine what happens in this country. And I, I believe that our number one priority should be to really truly understand what does it mean to believe in, in America first? And just shout out some answers. What does it mean to be America first? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 incredible answers. Like a, buy American, the Constitution, all these incredible things. Stand up for the flag. Absolutely. I love that one. I mean, it's hard for me to stand. I understand that. But... Um, <laughs> But really, and, and you know, I'm going to use a word that is kind of scary. And yesterday I was, I was trying to figure out a, a synonym for it. But I, and I, I got to talk to Dennis Prager and I was like, hey, what, what word could I use aside from this? And then Dennis said, well, why, Madison, why would you not use that word? And he needed a cigar and have a fireside chat. And because and, and I, I wanted to say, well, you know, being America first means that you, you're a nationalist, that you believe in, in this country. And just like anything else, nationalism can be mistrued. Nationalism can become dangerous and deadly. Uh, but I believe that it is incumbent upon all of us to save this nation. I, now, I, I'll tell you, I, 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 I'm, I'm a devout Christian. Uh, I've got a great relationship with my Lord and Savior. And so, of course, I love being able to help people. I love taking care of people. I, I, I think we should send missionaries out into the world. We should bring people to Christ. I think the most important thing for us to do is to save souls to Jesus, to the really Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's our job as Christians. And I believe that we are a Christian nation. You know, almost every single one of the signers 
Uh, they were regular church attending Christians. So anybody who wants to tell you they're atheists or deists, they're idiots. Don't listen to them. Uh, I think John Lovell had an incredible quote when he said, when you hear some horse manure, just instantly, and he, he's, he's a much more pious man than I am. I would use a different word. Uh, but when you hear that, just call it out instantly. So when people say that we're not a Christian nation, that we were founded by racists, by evil men, that's wrong. The people who founded this nation should be revered, and they should be taught to the next generation as the heroes of the 18th century. But I, I, I'll tell you, I believe that before we as a Christian nation start going out and, and paying for, for gender studies in Egypt and giving all this foreign aid, why don't we start by serving the homeless veterans on the side of the street? Instead of being the, the police force of the world, some people who want to say, oh my goodness, well, you know what? There's this terrible border crisis going on in Ukraine and Russia, Vladimir Putin, blah, blah. I don't care. I, I, I really don't. And I love Eastern Europe. I'm sure it's a great place. But until we get our own southern border secured, I don't give a damn about the border conflict in Ukraine. And so today I'm here to make the case for being an America first patriot. And when I say make the case for it, I, I believe that it is our duty. And, and most of us in this room are, are, are pretty young. We're all within the same generation. Uh, I see a lot of, there all, there's a lot of generations represented in this room. And, and when I look out of this room, I have to tell you how honored I am to be alive when we all are alive today. Because I used to pray all the time. Uh, you know, I, I would say, God, you know, why did you not let me be alive, you know, in the 1940s to fight against, you know, the, the, in World War II or to be a, alive during the revolution? I want to I be a warrior for you. I want to save my country. I want to do all these great things. But you had me born in 1995 at the height of the most peaceful and prosperous time the world has ever known. You know, give me an opportunity. Well, guys, I got to say, I'm sorry for praying that prayer. Um, I think God has answered in a big way, and he said, well, you know what, here's tyranny, uh, here are people trying to censor your speech, here are people trying to control every bit of your lives, here are people trying to say, well, you have to have this forced medical operation to be able to operate in normal society. What? My friends, you know, I went to New York City, oh, it was awful, but I went to New York City uh, this past week, and I, I, was, I was filming a Fox hit. And when I was there, we went out to dinner and they were like, oh, we're going to need to see your, your vaccine card. And I said, absolutely not. Even if I had a vaccine card, I would refuse to eat here because the only way, the only way that we are going to be able to get out of the situation that we are facing in this country where the tyranny is starting to come down upon us is if we start exercising a little civil disobedience. If we as Americans who say, hey, you know what, I love this country more than I love my government, and so if you want to give these edicts, if you want to give these unconstitutional orders, I will reject them and I will go about my life and say, I'll, I'm just, I'll shoot you the finger, I really will. Now, I know there's probably some Christians in here who are saying, but what about in, in Romans where it says that you need to uh, you know, be submissive unto, uh, unto the, the governments that I place in authority over you? Well, I, I understand that, but... Does anybody know what the preamble to the Constitution says? What are the first three words? We the people. So in our founding documents, it says that we are the authority. It says that people like me, a congressman, I serve you. And so when the government is not, when the government is not working on your behalf, it is your duty to disregard their orders. It is your duty to be civilly disobedient. I believe that's what we're all called to do. And so I know I went into some, some policy ideas of things that we can do and I have to say how sick and tired I am of having to say I'm a Republican. And I am a Republican, but first and foremost, I'm an American. And when I say that, it's because all of us in this room, you know, we can blame Antifa, we can blame Black Lives Matter, we can blame Joy Mayer, we can, we can blame all these terrible people for the problems we're facing in our country. But I believe the true problem that we're facing in our country is for the last six decades, we have had a Republican Party who has set down and allowed the radical left to run a rough shot over every single one of us. We've had this party who's just said, you know what, let's, let's go there. Let's debate about tax policy and incremental GDP growth at the end of the year. Let, let's, let's do all of that. And when I hear all, all of these things, it's as if these people believe that we're an economy that happens to be inside of a country. No, we are a country that has an economy inside of it. The economy serves us. And the way to make sure we have a strong economy is to make sure we have a strong society. And I, I believe, as people who believe in the America First message, we are here to make sure that we have the strongest America 
the world can ever have. And the way to ensure that is to embrace Judeo-Christian values, number one. But two, it is to reinforce the importance of the family unit. That is our number one priority. Any policy, any policy that you hear that is trying to tell you that we're going to have government intervention into the ability for a father and a mother to raise their child should be highly scrutinized and fiercely fought against. The and none of you who are parents in this room signed up to co-parent with the government. And, you know, I, I know I started out with some, with some uh, policy ideas, but, and people will call me a radical for believing that, you know, you should be a Christian, you should get married young, you should have as many kids as possible, you should try and have a great job, you should be as successful as you possibly can. They'll say I'm an extremist for that. And I just look at them and I say, how can you believe that? I genuinely just care about dining room politics. I care about that young family who's sitting around the dinner table. And what are they thinking about when they're seeing their young children eat? They're thinking about, am I going to be able to send them to a, a good school? One, I think you should homeschool. I was homeschooled all the way through. I am proudly a college dropout. If you are not becoming an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer, I highly encourage you to drop out. It's a scam. Um, but I believe that we should care about those dining room politics that unites all of us across the board. Because, you know, if you sit down with, with somebody on the other side, and they're, they're, they just they kind of lean left because the culture around them is indoctrinated in it. They've been indoctrinated to it since they've been in the government schools. Well, if you sit there and have a conversation with them for over 10 minutes, you get past all of these, these pre-programmed, indoctrinated, and brainwashed pre-programmed responses they have. And then they actually have to sit there and talk to you using original thoughts and using common sense. And common sense is contrary to everything that they believe because they've had to spend billions of dollars to be able to try and manipulate them. And so when we talk about these dining room politics, these America first agenda items, it's very simple stuff. It's, hey, I want to have very, very strong law enforcement. I want to have the ability to be able to defend myself. If you break into my home and you try to hurt my family, I will kill you. I... I I believe that we should have a strong economy and the way that we do that is by encouraging people to be able to go out and take risks. It's by saying, hey, instead of taking out that $100,000 business loan as an 18 year old or $100,000 student loan, which is worthless as an 18 year old, why don't you, why does the government not allow us to be able to take out a $10,000 business loan at 18 to be able to go and create an economy, create work, create all these great things. And another thing that I think we should start waging into is this idea of, of culture. And for a long time, the Republican Party and, and people that have come before us, and I'm not here to blame other generations. I was born in this day and age, and we will save this country, regardless of what has happened before it. But for so long, people have said, hey, don't talk about religion and politics. Let's not get involved in that because you might offend somebody. Well, good. I will offend you. Because I believe those are the most important things we can talk about. If you want a Bolshevik revolution in my country, if you want to introduce a socialist ideology, you know, I, I had some members of the squad one time tell me, hey, you know what? And I know, it's, it's sad. Pray for me. I go to work every day with Nancy Pelosi and AOC. It's, it's awful. <laughs> but I had one of them one time tell me, uh, hey, you know what? The person I am on, on media and on social media, you know, the, I, that, that's just work. I, I can be amicable outside of work. And I almost was, I was in the elevator with the person. I almost said, oh, hey, yeah, no, I understand. So let's... Um, that, 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 that's cool. Yeah, maybe we can grab a drink one day. But then I stopped myself and I said, you know what? I have no desire to be friends with you outside of, of this environment because you are trying to indoctrinate my generation to believe that the most lethal ideology in history that killed 100 million people in the 20th century is good and moral and just. You are trying to steal my generation's ability to write their own destiny away from them. So no, I have no desire to be your friend. And in fact, I will defeat you in every single aspect of this world. And now again, the, 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 the more typical Republican probably would have said, well, oh yeah, no, that's great. Let's go out and get a drink and let's all be a part of this uniparty and let's vote against our constituents. Absolutely not. The, remember, like I said, we the people is the preamble to the Constitution, preamble to what we believe. 
you all are in charge, I serve you. And so if I have a socialist who's trying to destroy your lives, I don't care about being friends with them outside of the country. When you have one of your radical family members who's gone to Brownell or some ridiculous university and been indoctrinated and come home and said, well, mother, I'm now actually non-binary, and sir, if you could refer to me as he, as, and, as a woman, she says that. Now, if somebody wants to change their name, and I... I, 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 I have a lot of empathy for this. If, if a guy wants to change his name to some feminine name, my name's Madison, so again, I have empathy for this. And he wants to be called Ashley. I've got no problem with that. That's cool. That, that's your decision. But if you want me to sit here and call a man a woman, you are asking me to buy into this lie. And I, I'll say no to that. I will say no to that in every single way. And now, don't get me wrong, I will defend, I, I, I don't care if you're, if you're trans, if you're gay, if you're Muslim, if you're black, if you're white, I will defend your constitutional rights as hard as I can at all times, no matter what. But I believe, again, I believe that we as conservatives need to start waging into this culture war. Because when you want to take your ideology and now force it onto our children, well, we are going to fight against that and it is our duty to do so. When you want to say that mothers who go and speak at a school board meeting are, are domestic terrorists, well, my friends, when I take power back, I will be holding you accountable to that. The things that you want to hold us accountable for, I will start launching investigations into you, and we'll start figuring out who the real domestic terrorists are. Because remember, my friends, it, the things that unite us as Americans are very simple, because it, you know, it, one... And we all have a pretty strong libertarian streak that runs through us. I genuinely believe that. And I think libertarianism is great. I would be a full-on libertarian if I lived in 1806 and people believed uh, in, in the Ten Commandments as, as much as they did back then. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world now. And so I, I believe that cultural conservatism is the only way that we're going to be able to save our country. I believe that encouraging strong family values, regardless of the backlash you're going to face, regardless of the arrows that you're going to take in the back, is the only way that we save this country. I believe that encouraging people to, to instead of encouraging churches, just, well, get as many baptisms as you can, get as many offering places as you can, as many donations as you can. No, let's encourage the church to stand up and get off the sideline and start working on discipleship rather than just, rather than just <laughs> baptisms. Because if you go back and you look through the 1750s and the 1760s to look back at what the pastors back in those days were actually talking about, it's as if they just read the newspaper the week before and said, huh, I wonder what the Bible says about that. I'm going to go preach on that. But now we have all these woke Christian pastors who are coming out and wanting to say, oh, well, let's fly the Black Lives Matter flag out there. Let's, let's do all these things. It's disgusting. Christians are, you're not here to protect your tax exempt status as a pastor. You are here to be salt and light in this earth and you should demand that of your pastors. And guys, you know, I'm looking at this clock and to the people backstage, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to go to a minute over. I, 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 the time's run away from me. I had a lot more points that I wanted to make, but I, I just want us all to lean in for a second to, to really hear the last bit of words that I'm going to say. Is that, and you, I'm sure you all have heard Charlie Kirk say this many times, that in our country, um, you know, if we, did, if we believe that we're going to radically change our country and get back to our founding values and it's not going to cost us anything, then we are fooling ourselves. My friends, I, I believe that we as the patriotic Americans who were born for such a time as this, as uh, Esther's uncle told her in the time, to, in, to influence the secular government of our time, God put us here because he knew that we could handle it. And we can handle it while being able to lean on him. And I will tell you, we're going to face some dark times as a nation. I genuinely believe that. I think we have an opportunity in the next four to six years to prevent kinetic American forces, countrymen on countrymen, from ever meeting. And I think that is incumbent upon all of us. Although I have no doubt that we'd be victorious if that ever happened. But remember, that would be, that would be so immoral and wrong. If we just said, hey, you know what, let's just, let's just kick off a civil war and then we'll, we'll, we'll just go ahead and go to that point. No, my friends, we were called to be innocent as doves, yes, but we were also called to be shrewd as snakes. And we as conservatives, it's time for us to get shrewd. It's time for us, in, in Genesis, it talks about taking dominion of the earth. You read that original word. I mean, it means go out and take control of it. Take, dominate the earth that you're given. Fill it. And my friends, the only way we're going to do that is if we stop playing this lackluster, milk toast defensive game where we're all just saying, hey, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to talk about religion and politics. No, I'm going to lean in 
I'm going to take some punches on the chin. I think all of us in this room are too. And we are going to stand up for the America that we all know and believe in. Because when we do that, when we stop saying, oh, yeah, I believe in free trade. No, screw that. I believe in dominant American trade. When I ask OPEC for oil, although we'll drill it here, they're going to say, yes, sir, we'll give it all right away. Thank you so much for all that you've done. My friends, as Americans, it's time for us to stop being sheep, stand up, and be lions. Let's make these people be... The last thing I'm going to say, because we're about to start playing music, last thing I'm going to say is that the radical left should be terrified of who we are. The radical left should be terrified of what we are going to do. And if you want to introduce a globalist agenda in this country, well, we are going to politically, uh, psychologically, in ev every form that we can confront you, we will defeat the globalists in this nation. My friends, it's up to all of us. Thank you all so much. Nothing protects your wealth like gold and silver when you buy from the right source. At Republic Monetary Exchange, we do business in person. Take immediate delivery of your gold and silver, and if you need to sell, get immediate payment. No waiting and no worries. That's how we do business, risk-free. Don't wait weeks for your gold or money from a broker you've never seen. Republic Monetary Exchange, gold and silver, immediate delivery. That's how we do business. Camelback, just east of 40th Street. The politicians don't want you to know what they're up to. Secret slush funds, secret emails, and pay to play. Judicial Watch is your watchdog in Washington, D.C., shining the light of transparency on our nation's capital. The lockdowns will go down as one of the worst decisions ever made in the history of our country, bar none. You have money, you can survive a lockdown. You don't, you have to fight. Everything I stand for is for the betterment of the individual. As soon as the government comes in and starts to take freedoms away from us, it's very hard to get them back. I'm of the opinion that you have to do what is right. Let me finish. I let you say your nonsense, let me say my facts. This is a cultural fire alarm. I believe in the American ethos. Equal of this human. Out of many one. This is a movement of optimism and one of hope. It's always been we the people. It's been bottom up. It is a citizen-led experiment. This is a conservative movement that wants to put our country first and put our generation first. It's time for our generation to start to rise up and take back America for freedom. Yeah. to that the fire right as you turn around the corner please sit down everybody uh, w what a great couple days hasn't it this has been incredible and I got to tell you we, we do so much at Turning Point USA on campus high school college chapters uh, we're working really hard and as you can see look around you the team went above and beyond at Turning Point USA to make sure that you, you had a special couple days and you know, from the country music to the early worship on Sunday to all the breakouts to the sponsors, uh, it really was a very, very special weekend. And I am happy to say that all of you can now say that you were part of the largest multi-day conservative event in American history. It's amazing. So... I want to talk about a couple things as we kind of close this conference, and then, of course, we have the wonderful Kaylee McEnany coming up, which is, I mentioned this briefly in our opening remarks, and Turning Point USA, we are a student organization first and foremost, and I think we need to kind of zero in on the problems and the issues that are facing our generation and Generation Z. Now, I'm what would be called a transgenerational. I get to choose what generation I'm part of. So I, I disavow millennials, okay? So I get to be Generation Z um, or whatever. But whether it's millennial or Generation Z, 
And every parent out here, as I talk about this, I'm not blaming the older generation for these conditions, but it's important that we do take a step back and say that young people are, uh, they're, they're entering into a world that is completely and fundamentally different than one that was in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, this is the most depressed, most suicidal, most drug addicted, most alcohol addicted, least married, uh, ch most childless generation in American history. And we should take a pause and ask ourselves the question, what is causing this and what are we doing to stop it? First and foremost on an individual level, then on a family level, then a community level, and then on a national political level. And first on the individual level, um, I think that one of the major issues that we're seeing is that we have a generation that is searching for meaning and searching for purpose. And when you see that here at this conference, the most enthusiastic applause lines and speakers are people that are not just saying that the right is good and the left is bad, but instead of saying, here's what you got to do to get your life in order to find something that's actually going to live longer than you. You see, one of the major mistakes we've made in America, and we're fixing it here at America Fest, is that we used to tell young people that you're the problem and you have a lot of work to do, and America's wonderful. Now we say to young people, you're wonderful and America's terrible. We totally flipped it upside down. And one of the main reasons why we have over 100,000 young people that have overdosed on opioids in the, this, this year alone, 100,000 young people, is that students and members of Generation Z and millennials, they look around, they say that there is no purpose or meaning or place for me. And that's one of the big lies. You want to talk about the big lie? The big lie is allowing a generation to literally believe that there is no place for them to be able to succeed and flourish in this country. And so you look at the statistics, it's the most suicidal generation in American history. Now if I were to ask the audience how many of you know someone personally that committed suicide, almost every, raise your hand, almost every single hand goes up. This should be a fire alarm for our civilization, by the way. And by the way, it's way more important than systemic racism. I'm, well, I'm way more interested in systemic suicide in our country than systemic racism, which doesn't exist, by the way, which is systemic racism does not exist in America, but systemic suicide does. And what is causing this? Well, there's a lot of different factors. I think technology is playing a huge role in this. In fact, I think that, it, and I, I see this all the time, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but honestly, if I do, I don't care, because it's the last day. So, um, and you're not getting a refund, so. Uh, sorry, which is when I see eight-year-olds at a, at a restaurant and no one's talking to one another and everyone's staring at screens and they give a seven-year-old an iPad, which is basically a digital pacifier, I think there's something really wrong with that. I think there's something deeply unhealthy with that. And so some of you might remember last year in Palm Beach at the Student Action Summit, I gave a list of things that I would like everyone to do, and I was pretty kind of intensely um, against technology. And then, you know, this year was a wonderful year. I got married in May, uh, which was awesome. And I encourage every young person to get married early. Uh, it's not a joke I, when I say that. You should reject hookup culture. You should save yourself for one human being and get married early. I, I don't give advice to young women on how to find a man. Uh, I will say to young men, uh, get your act together and, and really make self-control and self-discipline uh, a priority in your life. One of the reasons why so many young women are upset with the dating pool, I hear this all the time, is that they see men that can't control themselves. And, they see, and as you can tell, the young ladies are very enthusiastic about hearing this. And by the way, here, here's a thought crime for you. Women want to be led. Women want to be led by strong men. And you will, men are different than women and women are different than men and both need each other, by the way. And so when I got married back in May to my wonderful wife, I decided to turn my phone off completely for 10 days. Just turn it off and just focus on each other, focus on God. And it was one of the most incredible experiences for a variety of reasons. And as I look back at this year, this, that was really a couple days that changed my life, where we went on this incredible honeymoon in paradise, 
and we were focusing on one another and focusing on the natural beauty and focusing on God and all these amazing things. And we were looking around at these other people that were vacationing and honeymooning, by the way. And they weren't focusing on each other. They were like strangely bringing their friends from 2,000 miles away into paradise, either like because they're so, they're so kind of like unable to deal with the current moment or they're so narcissistic they need to tell everybody that they're on the beach in the Caribbean. And what was amazing is watching couple after couple and family after family, not even with kids there, no one was talking to one another. Instead, they were Snapchatting and Instagramming and going through TikTok. Meanwhile, there's a whole world out there that they were missing. And I realized that the introduction of this technology, it doesn't, it, it, look, technology can be a positive. But I, I think that's a bad argument. You know, a lot of people say, you know, technology only gives you more of what you already have and less of what you don't have. I don't think that's true. I think these phones are changing who we actually are as human beings. I think that it's actually remaking what we get angry about, what we get happy about, and what we, what we value. And so after the honeymoon, I uh, did a lot of thinking and I wrote a whole piece about this. And I, I asked, and I, I've always been super jealous of practicing Jews that, were, that practiced the Sabbath. And then I asked myself, well, why, didn't, why don't we do that as Christians more, right? And I, I really did a lot of thinking in, in July. I said, okay, Friday night, I'm going to start doing the Sabbath. Turn off my phone, no technology. At first, it was really hard. I got to be honest. You get really anxious, like, am I missing something? And in August, September, October, November, every Friday night for 25 hours, and yes, 25, that's right, you add an hour on, uh, for an extra hour of prayer and meditation, um, I started this year just completely turning my phone off, off the grid, right? Giving one day to God. And I have to tell you right now, um, it was this amazing revelation of something I would always be saying in front of audiences, but then I realized how true it was, which is that God gave us the law to bless us. You see, in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, uh, a great example is that one of the, the only Ten Commandments, Ten Commandment that actually uh, comes with a promise is honor your mother and father so you might live long in the land of which you are in. Good advice for every student out there, honor your parents, it's very important. Every totalitarian country tries to break the bond between parents and children. They do this time and time again. This is why queer theory, transgender theory, critical race theory, wokeism, diversity, equity, inclusion, they're trying to break the bond between a parent and child. But also, it says very clearly that we must dedicate one day to God. And in Mark 2 or Mark 3, it says that, um, this, that we were not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It's that this is a gift for us. And you look in this hyper-technological world where everything is moving so fast. And you're, you're, you might be in this room right now or watching online. You might be super anxious. And someone might be trying to push medication on you that you don't need, by the way. And someone might be trying to tell you that, like, oh, all you have to do is do weed. Bad idea, by the way. Don't do that. And like, oh yeah, just take a hit of weed, or all you gotta do is drink before you go to bed. And like, you know that these substances probably aren't gonna give you what you're looking for when, have you tried dedicating one day out of the week to the Lord and turning off that stupid smartphone? Have you tried that? Because I can tell you, it was a massive blessing to me in 2021. Is that all of a sudden, it recenters your whole week. You journal, you read books. I know it's a radical thing. Um, and like, you could, you could do it to varying degrees. Some people don't get in cars. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I drive around sometimes on the Sabbath. Sometimes I was traveling, so I had to give a speech and just was, kind of wasn't able to cancel. The point is that throughout the day, you're not constantly checking for emails and messages. Instead, you're like, oh, I'm without kind of this, this coping mechanism I carry around with me, otherwise known as a smartphone. And so this year, as I look back at it, I, I don't know if we'd be able to have an event like this or the success we had if I personally wouldn't have realized that the Lord commands us to take one day to rest in the midst of all the craziness. And look, some of you might be busier than me. You might be. Um, if, you, if you traveled more than 330 days this year and did more than 600 podcasts and met, you know, have over 200 people on staff, 200 full-time people on staff and have to raise a lot of money, maybe you're busier than me. Maybe you are. I'm not saying I'm the busiest person there. I'm not. The point is that if I'm able to do the Sabbath, I really encourage you guys to do this. In fact, I think that if just all regular Americans turned off TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Apple, all of a sudden, I think it would make America an infinitely better place to live. I truly do. So, a couple other things I want to share with you. And by the way, if, if 
I think that could help solve some of the issues of suicide, alcoholism, drug addiction, just that alone, and because I think it actually helps lead other things. Okay, um, my other advice to students and young people, and again, it's super contrarian, um, but it's true, is that you want, first you have to know what you want. It's a really important thing. I know that sounds so obvious, but so many young people don't even know what they want, which is why they're so miserable, right? Is that they, they don't even know what is good or what is, um, what is tragic or what is wonderful. And so you should want to be good at saying no. And not everyone's good at this, by the way. You, you should want, you should desire to be able to say no to your flesh and to temptation and to things that sound good and feel good in the moment. Here's a little secret for you. The highest productive, most productive people that you saw speak on this stage, the people that you might look up to like Tucker Carlson, they have made life choices that are permanent that say no to things that might make them feel good immediately. For example, Tucker Carlson doesn't drink, right? Not, not everyone knows that. And so, now by the way, I'm not a, if, you, if you drink, I really don't care. I'm, I'm not a moralist in that sense. However, that to, comp to compete at the level Tucker Carlson's at, to go do a nightly news show and to write it unique and all that, he admits that alcohol would weigh him down, that he wouldn't be able to do what he does. And so here's the lie that you're being told. You can't have it all. You can't. You have to prioritize some things. You can, you're going to have to let go of things that might make you feel good in the moment to go pursue something that is more meaningful than an instant dopamine kick. And here's another good rule for life. If it feels good in the moment, it's probably not good for you. If it feels good immediately, it's probably not good for you. And again, I, I, there, there's extremes to that, right? Like working out can feel really good. Um, you, there's also extremes to that. Again, you can make your own choices. You can see what you see fit. But I know right now that at least half the room, this is resonating at some fundamental level. Because if you're like, man, I got to get my life together going to 2022. I am not performing at the highest level I can. Well, then you should desire to be able to say no. Okay, the other thing. For all the young people out there, um, you, know my, you know my thoughts on college. We run a college organization. I think it's a scam. Um, I think most people shouldn't go to college. You know that. I speak openly about it. And um, I think parents sending your kids to college is playing Russian roulette with your kids' values, right? Um, and the wisest, most incredibly, incredible people, I think, are the ones that don't go to college. Now, of course, I lose my audience because you're like, okay, I'm in college. It doesn't do me any good, Charlie. Okay. So I, I get it. And, and I'm, just, I'm talking to high schoolers as well. And, and by the way, less than 5% of people that go to college probably need to go to college. Um, the 95%, it doesn't really do much for you. It doesn't. Instead, here's the charge that you should have. Two things. You should try to become a better person. That's the most important thing. Number two thing, we need more young people to start new things. We need more young people to start new churches, to start new businesses, to start new families. You see, college doesn't teach you any of this. I, I always laugh when people say, yeah, I'm studying entrepreneurship. Like, yeah, you don't study entrepreneurship. You do entrepreneurship, okay? Like, it's like, I'm studying how to, you know, do, we need, so what, my challenge to you is for, there's some young person out there, you have a business idea, go do it. When you are 18, 19, and 20 years old, guess what, here's a little secret, you could always go back to college, always. They'll allow you as long as the check clears. It's true, it's not some rule that you have to go when you're 18. And by the way, it's mostly stuff that you're either gonna regret or forget. That's mainly what college is, okay? Regretting and forgetting. But guess what? If you're 18, you say, well, Charlie, what do I do instead? Super easy. Find something you're good at, not something you have a passion for. Two totally different things. I have a passion for college football. Very mediocre. Unless if you watch the Relief Factor ad, then I'm actually really good. So, um, and, but a skill I have is not that. Find your skill, not your passion. But again, hopefully it's not a skill that you like totally hate. Hopefully you like it. And then here's the thing. It's so simple. Go find someone who's really good and has perfected what your skill is and go ask them for a job or an unpaid internship. It's that simple. You don't need to go to college to do that. You need to be willing to succeed. It's that simple. And guess what? You want to, you want to stand out? If you're, an, if you're a 16 year old and you really want to stand out, and by the way, parents, you're, I could just feel the anxiety, the sweat, the denunciation the preparedness to say Charlie was wrong in the ride over. I, 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 I hear the conversation and that's, you know what? I embrace it fully because if someone needs to say this stuff out loud because it's true, which is if you're 16, 17 or 18 and you have that skill and you go find someone who's good at that, all of a sudden you want to stand out. If you want to be the person that people remember, 
It's not going to Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, or Yale, or any of that nonsense. You want to stand out? Be the kid that asked for an internship that was scrappy enough, hungry enough, and humble enough to go sweep floors, to learn the actual thing you need to do. That'll make you stand out if you want to go find a job and you want to climb up in what you want to do in the future. Okay, learn something new every single day. Something that excites me about all of you. And I just want to thank you. You guys are like the best audience. The, those of you that support Turning Point USA, those of you that support our podcast, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are so unbelievable, uh, especially those that listen to our podcast and support it. I'm so touched by that. Um, and something that really motivates me and encourages me is all of your desire to learn. And this is a great sign, by the way. If you want to be optimistic about something, it's that every single one of you you have a special focus and intensity lately to want to dive deeper into our history, into our ideas, and to where we came from. Guess what? That's a sign of a winning coalition. So here's my challenge to you, especially young people, people of all ages, is take a journal and say, I learned this about my country today. I learned this about philosophy today. A people that are learning constantly, you'll be able to find the answers and the clarity necessary to act and to be able to hold these tyrants and these authoritarians and these despicable narcissists accountable. Learn something new every single day. And so you say, well, Charlie, how do I do that? Okay, I'll make it really easy for you. We partner with Hillsdale College. They're amazing. You guys can go to charlieforhillsdale.com. Uh, do we have some Hillsdale students here? I think we do. Um, it's, and you guys can take their online courses. Super easy. Listen to my podcast. You can listen to Tucker. Whatever it is, make learning as important as bodybuilders make weightlifting. So I want you to think about that, is that if you are not using your mind every single, by the way, the mind is a beautiful gift from the Lord. And most people just kind of go through the motions. They don't really think deeply about what's going on around them. There's so much wonder and wisdom that will make your life so much more fulfilling. You want to know why this generation is so suicidal? We've told them that there's no truth worth pursuing. We've told them that there's no absolute truths. We've told them that, oh, you're just a bunch of cells a bunch of chemicals, just do things that make you feel good. When in reality, we know there's a transcendent order, where there's a creator that loves us and that we're made in his image, and that you want to know the beginning of philosophy, it starts with wonder, like, wow, there's so much in this world that I really don't understand. And wisdom is the knowledge of things that do not change. Wisdom is the knowledge of how human beings act and also things that are just as true as they were 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Practical knowledge is important. Wisdom or eternal knowledge is the most important thing. Finally, I want to just say that um, one of my favorite Bible verses that I don't think gets quoted enough is Philippians 4, 6 through 8, which is do not be anxious, but instead um, through prayer, thanksgiving, and supplication, make your requests known to God uh, for the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, and protect, will guard and protect your heart and mind in all circumstances. And whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is beautiful, whatever is kind, I get those words mixed up sometimes. Ponder and think on those things. For through Christ Jesus, he will set you free. One of my favorite verses. And basically, the whole idea is this. And I know there's, this is a huge problem. The mental health problem in our country is very significant, everybody. And it shouldn't be made fun of. But we must understand that the Lord gave us tools and abilities, especially for young people out there, for you to break free and to break through of maybe getting trapped in your own head, maybe getting trapped in your own thoughts, maybe the constant negativity that's around you. Here's the amazing message of positivity and optimism I have for you, is that through Jesus Christ, through the teaching of the scriptures, through things that are totally true and wise and eternally true, that every single person here can break through of any of that cycle of negativity you're in right now, and that tomorrow can be a much better day than today was. And today should be a better day than yesterday, and you can actually commit yourself that sort of improvement, because guess what? We have free will, we have agency, and we have the ability to continue to improve. And guess, and you put all that together. That's what makes America so incredibly special, is that in this country, you are able to use the liberty that the Lord gives you, because liberty is not man's idea, it's God's idea, to be able to pursue virtue and things that are always true. So I just want to encourage this generation. You guys get insulted way too much by, let's just say, boomers, okay? <laughs> this generation, there's going to be something very special that happens out of this generation. This generation is starting to wake up. 
They see the cost of the lockdowns, the masks, and the vaccine mandates. They're starting to ask questions. And this generation is going to be one that is going to turn, get it, the trajectory of the nation towards one that is filled of liberty and freedom and virtue and eternal things. And that's really what we at Turning Point USA fight for every single day. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Confident, bold, and willing to call it out. We cannot be silent. Jim Psaki promised us a daily White House press briefing. There isn't one today. There wasn't one Monday. When the going gets tough, the daily press briefing that she promised goes out the window. You don't have the press corps. You don't have the shouted questions because they simply do not care. Where are the investigative journalists? We are fighting for the rights of all Americans. Freedom is at risk. Ronald Reagan said it best. Freedom is one generation away from extinction. Uh, and that is why we bring children into this world, to carry on the message of the United States of America, of your family unit, of your faith, whatever that may be. Carry on the values that we hold dear. For being here. It's an honor to close out America Fest. Have you all had fun? I love it. Well, as you all know, you may have watched, I spent a lot of time taking questions from the White House podium, but I have a question today, an important question. What is going on at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? What is going on? I mean, just last week, I watched our President Joe Biden refer to President Kamala Harris, okay? So then I, I flip over to see what the vice president's up to, and literally she's doing this interview with Charlemagne. Did any of you see it? This is a direct quote. No, 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 no. And don't start talking like a Republican. And it's Joe Biden, and it's Joe Biden, and it's Joe Biden, and I'm vice president, and my name is Kamala Harris. What is wrong with this lady? What is wrong? I mean, I don't know what's worse. Who's out of it more, Joe Biden or Kamala? It's really a toss-up which is mildly concerning because they're running our country. But there's that. A lot has changed. I mean, I think President Trump is a vast change from Joe Biden. We're seeing the disaster of the Joe Biden presidency. But not only has the president changed, the leader of the free world, the questions coming from the White House reporters have changed. Have you guys noticed that? Or maybe you're not watching the briefings. I don't know. They are a bit difficult to watch. I limit the time that I watch them. But when I do watch them, I'm just absolutely stunned by what I hear from the press corps. The first briefing that Jen Psaki gave, one of the questions asked from the press corps was this. Could you give us some color about what it was like for Joe Biden going into the Oval Office? He's been waiting for this for so long. What was his reaction? Wow. I would have loved that question. Never got it. <laughs> then there was this. Will Joe Biden keep Donald Trump's Air Force One color scheme? Ooh, hard-hitting question. 
And there was this. Can you clarify for us what happened with the president's dog? There are some reports that one of them was involved in a biting accident, to which Jen Psaki replied, there was one bite. We later learned many months down the road there were multiple bites. I'm not sure why you would mislead on something as innocuous as a dog bite, but indeed, that's the lay of the land there at the White House. And then my favorite question was this. Any update on the White House cat? Whoa. Now compare, rewind when I was at the podium. Here's some of the stellar questions that were asked of me. Let me ask if I can, Kaylee, why does the president keep hiring people who are dumb as a rock, overrated, way over their heads, wacko and incompetent? Was a question. Then there was, so you've used the phrase warriors to describe everyday Americans fighting the pandemic. The president's using that phrase as well. What's the thinking behind using that description? And is he, bet, or is he basically asking Americans to put themselves in harm's way, harm's way like warriors do? No, I think he's just praising the American people for fighting through COVID-19, but there you go. And, and then there was the question, you can literally go back and watch. I'm like flipping through the pages of my binder, finding my tab, and then I pause and I look up like this in total bewilderment, because this is the question I was asked. Does President Trump believe that it was a good thing that the South lost the Civil War? Really? They say there's no such thing as a dumb question, but make no mistake, that is a very dumb question. But I will tell you, the answers coming from the podium have changed as well. There's a lot of deception. We were told that Republicans want to defund the police. Republicans, they literally said that. And for that one, the so-called fact checkers woke up and gave the administration three Pinocchios. That's rare for a liberal president, but they did that. We were told Biden never called the travel restrictions on China xenophobic. He did, you can go find the tweet. We're told there's no crisis on the southern border. No, tens of thousands of illegal immigrants sitting under a bridge in Del Rio in human excrement and squalid conditions. That's not a crisis, the White House tells us. If that's not a crisis, I'm not sure what the definition of crisis is, because that's pretty squarely a crisis. We were told there's not a crime problem, it's just a gun problem. Uh, we were told that that Build Back Better, which, thank goodness, Joe Manchin, <laughs> Joe Manchin, he deserves a clap. Joe Manchin put an end to, we're told it would cost zero dollars. The White House is still saying that lie. And then there's the lie that Trump never did anything constructive in the Middle East. We were told that. Okay, wait. One, two, three Middle East peace deals, more than any president before him. I think he did something constructive in the Middle East, but nevertheless, that is what we are told. But let me back up about how I got to the podium, because I think it's an instructive story um, for anyone who wants to pursue a career in politics, media, or whatever you want to pursue. Um, my opportunity at the podium really came out of nowhere. I was riding in the car with my daughter, baby Blake, in the back, and my mom's driving. And I get this call on my phone. It was an odd set of numbers, and I knew it to be the White House switchboard. And I knew the president not well, I would say. We had spoken a handful of times. I had seen him on the campaign trail because I was his campaign press secretary. But I get this call. I'm like trying to keep my daughter quiet, pink pacifier in the mouth, like stay quiet. It's the president of the United States calling. And he called, and out of the blue, he said, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And he said, would you be interested in being my White House press secretary? To which I responded, Mr. President, that would be the honor of my lifetime. To which, <laughs> and he responded with Mark, get it done. And I think he meant Mark Meadows, go get it done. But it was, uh, it was surreal uh, because I had interned in the White House for the Bush administration. I had watched Dana Perino give a press briefing. She's great. Love her. My colleague now at Fox, you know, I had interned at Fox. I had worked my way up through the political ranks. And this idea of standing at a podium where I was just an intern in the back of the room watching the press secretary at the podium, it was something to take in. But that's where hard work can get you. I believe in this room. We have a future White House press secretary, maybe even a future president. I'm so impressed with all of you. But I'll tell you, I had a lot of apprehension uh, after taking the job. I wondered if I'd be able to do it. It was a big task, taking to the podium during COVID-19. I was riding up with my husband in his truck up the Eastern Corridor, and I was uh, 
kind of a nerd uh, in college and, and in high school, and I was on the debate team. I loved preparation. So, you know, I'm madly reading academic journal articles about how to be a good press secretary. I'm calling people. I'm like, how do I do this? And my dad texted me this salient message that just cut through the noise, and of course, preparation's important. Uh, but he said to me, Kaylee, maybe you were made, quote, for such a time as this. And those words are from the book of Esther, Esther 4, 14. Separately, apart from my dad, a liberal democratic commentator said to me, Kaylee, maybe you were made for such a time as this. And I don't know about all of you, but if you're a believer in this room, a lot of times when God's trying to send you a message, he sends the same message through two different people. Or you hear it in a sermon and then you immediately open your devotional and you see the same message. That's when God's trying to beat you over the head and say, hey, I want you to have this message. And he indeed wanted me to have that message. Thank you. My first day came. It was April 13th, 2020, and I'm going to the White House, and it's pouring rain, not the ideal way to start a new job. I'm in the press secretary's office, sitting there, taking in the moment as I have, like, water up to my knees on my pants. It was, like, not ideal, but, you know, I'm sitting there, and I get a call later in the day, first day as press secretary, Kaylee, come to the Oval Office, and... Though I had been an intern, though I had been a Trump supporter for a while, I had never been inside the Oval Office. So my first trip into the Oval Office is to brief the President of the United States. And I pass this mahogany grandfather clock that's off to the left when you walk in the Oval Office. And I go onto the sunbeam pattern rug that President Reagan, his administration had designed, and President Trump repurposed it for his Oval Office. And I sit across from the Resolute desk. That was a desk that was gifted to us from Queen Victoria in 1880. And I'm sitting there on this gold couch thinking, I'm going to have to brief the President of the United States. And I watch him, and I quickly learned he doesn't prep questions like where I'd be in my office and my team would come in and ask me questions and we'd think through the question and answer. He really put a lot of focus on his introduction and the scripted remarks. And it's in a binder much like this one. Uh, and I'm watching him, and he's taking a Sharpie, and he's crossing through things. Um, he tore parts he didn't like. One time, I think I even saw him take scissors and just chop a part off. So <laughs> instead of his staff editing his remarks, that's how he did things. And I realized we're not going to have a lot of time for questions. So as he's about to walk out, I go, Mr. President, I know what you're going to be asked today. And he said, what's that? And I go, well, Dr. Fauci, always causing a problem in the White House, Dr. Fauci went out on CNN and said, look, maybe if mitigation would have started sooner, then, you know, perhaps uh, we could have saved more lives, to which the press was spinning and contorting and saying, Dr. Fauci said Trump could have saved more lives. Um, so I told the president that, and he said, well, what would you say? Now, I had been a religious watcher of the White House Coronavirus Task Force briefings, and my parents would come in, and I would say, I'd pause it and say, when you all stop talking, I will resume. I have to take my notes. And so I had watched these briefings. I had all the facts in my head, and I said, Mr. President, here's what I'd say. I would say, on January 6th, there was not a single confirmed case of COVID-19, and you issued a travel notice for Wuhan. On uh, January 11th, still zero cases. CDC issued a level one travel notice. January 21st, the CDC activated an emergency operations center. There was just one COVID case at that time. And then on January 31st, you implemented the travel ban on China that your opponent, Joe Biden, called xenophobic. And he said, go type that up for me. So <laughs> run back to my office. I type it up. I type it up and I give it to him and he would never read a scripted answer to a question because unlike the current guy, he's the commander in chief, he's the one calling the shots, he's the one making the decisions, the information's in his mind, he doesn't need to read a scripted note from a staffer like Joe Biden does. But on that day, only time I saw the president do this, he read that timeline word for word and I thought, good job for the first day in the White House, Kaylee. <laughs> So the president was doing the briefings, and I wondered if I'd ever be asked to give a briefing. It had been 400 days since a press secretary had ever given a briefing. And then out of nowhere, Trump looks at me and says, give a briefing, Kaylee. 
thought, oh, wow, this is like on a Wednesday. And then he said it again and again, and I thought, okay, I need to give myself weeks to prepare, at least a week. I need to get a binder together. And finally, on like Thursday, he said, do a briefing and do it before Monday. So, wow, this is going to be a quick 24-hour turnaround. Which, by the way, I think I know why the president said for me to give a briefing. One day, uh, he said to me, I, I would take very good personal notes just for my personal consumption, um, and I'd write them down. And one day he said to me, Kaylee, let me see those notes. So I show him the notes. He said, These are beautiful notes. And any time he would meet with governors, senators, you name it, he would tell me to hold up my notebook like a proud father so all could see them. And I think he said, you know, if Kaylee could take notes and, and have all this together, she can do a briefing. So I, I get ready to do the briefing. I get the binder together. And I'll tell you, that binder, that became something uh, that was written about by CNN, among others. The, there was actually a camera behind me, and they would take pictures of my binder to try to get the tabs and I guess get some intel. I don't know why quite they were taking the pictures of my binder from behind me. But it led CNN to write this, uh, decoding the mysteries of Kaylee McEnany's briefing book. Now, we thought instead of having like COVID therapeutics testing, we would do like Jim Acosta, John Carl, Caitlin Collins as the tabs. That would have been really fun, and that is a big regret that we did not do that head fake for the reporters. But, oh, thank you. I love you guys. Thank you. But I'll tell you, as we prepared to go to the podium that day, we put in all the work, all the human preparation. Uh, but I'll tell you, the most important thing I did was on the spiritual side. I, that morning, the morning of my first briefing, May 1st, 2020, I listened to a Joyce Meyer sermon about faith over fear. I prayed. I, I listened to Christian music. I tweeted out Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I will tell you, I got a lot of messages coming in from Christians, like Sarah Sanders, my predecessor, who said to me, I read my Jesus Calling before every, before every briefing, and she, she's great. I love her. She shared with me the message from exactly two years prior in her Jesus Calling, and it said this, You are on the path of my choosing. There is no randomness about your life. As you give yourself more and more to a life of constant communion with me, you will find that you simply have no time to worry. But I worried that day. I worried a lot. <laughs> I was very nervous. So I actually was so nervous that I was crying in my office when I was supposed to be at the podium. My assistant came in and was like, Kayla, you can't be crying. You need to be at, at the White House podium. And so she got my parents on speakerphone, and we all prayed together. And then I went to the West Wing private bathroom. I got on my knees, and I said a prayer. And when I walked to that podium, when I stood at that podium, I had gone from tears to utter and complete serenity. I, I'm telling you. I felt like I was meant to be there. And it wasn't because of me, I can tell you, that I felt that peace. It was because I heard it all the time from people like you that you prayed for the administration. And we felt it. I certainly felt it. I thank you for that. But look, my press shop, I decided, my dad said to me, come up with a motto for the press shop. And I said, okay, I need to come up with a motto. What do I want to be the guiding principle of this press office? And I thought about it, and I came up with offense only. Offense only. Because for a long time, I had seen conservatives maligned, trashed, defamed by the liberal media. And I walked in with no illusion as to who I was dealing with, tried to get, start out on a good foot with the media, but they very quickly made it personal. You saw some of the attacks and questions they were asked. And to be honest, it reminds me a lot of what you all go through on your college campuses. And I write about that in my book, you know, my time at Harvard Law School, where I loved it. It was a dream of mine to go there. It was uh, walking, walking to the class in, in those crisp fall mornings. It was a real honor. They have the Socratic method in law school where they grill you on a case, and it's really good preparation for taking to a podium one day. But I'll tell you this. I was so dismayed at the environment at Harvard Law from some of the students in particular. I left academia, I think, right when it started to get really, really bad. And I know you guys feel it on your campuses. I left right in 2014, uh, well, it was actually two years later, but 2014 was really a turning point. That was the Ferguson shooting, as some of you may remember, uh, and there were a lot of protests on campuses, and, you know, I simply spoke out and said, look, 
Um, I love our police. They're great, hardworking men and women. Before you demonize Darren Wilson, let's wait for the facts to come out. That's it. That's all I said. But they didn't wait. They did not wait for the facts to come out. Because Obama's own Department of Justice, Obama's Department of Justice, concluded, based on this investigation, the department has concluded that Darren Wilson's actions do not constitute prosecut prosecutable violations. But nevertheless, I was called vitriolic for standing up for the police. Um, they're literally, it got so bad where they put tape in, on the wall of the student common area, and they said privileged speech goes on this side, and non-privileged speech goes on this side. That's how caustic it got on campus, which is why it's so important for us to speak truth and to be bold, even though it's hard. Because the tactics that I experienced from the press corps are the same tactics that the left is bringing to your college campus. So with grace and with kindness and with compassion, but with truth, we have to be bold and stand firm in our convictions. And that's exactly what I did with the press. And since I left, I will say there has been a whole lot of vindication for the Trump administration, which is why I'm so glad that we shared our, the truth boldly from the podium. Uh, for example, and I think I, I run through these at any speech I do because I think it's so important to have accountability for the liberal hyenas in the press corps. So NPR, here's what they told us. This was a headline that I had to deal with at the podium. Peaceful protesters tear gas to clear way for Trump church photo op. You remember that when St. John's church burned? It's the church across from the White House. Well, we were told that Trump tear gassed and public protesters for that photo op. And I said, no, that was not the case. I told them, but they ran with their headlines. Like the Washington Post, inside the push to tear gas protesters ahead of a Trump photo op. Washington Post also, from Tiananmen Square to Lafayette Square. They literally compared the two. CNN's Jim Acosta, oh, Jim. Do you, do you notice I always used to say I like your tie, Jim? It was a way to, like, soften him up before going in for the attack. Um, I wonder if I did that this day when he asked me if the White House, the president, and his team had to do it all over again, would you have gassed and pummeled protesters to clear the park so the president could have a photo op? Oh, wait. Eight months later, the Department of Interior Inspector General, Department of Interior Inspector General, not a right-wing news source, found this. We determined that the evidence did not support a finding that the U.S. Park Police cleared the park on June 1st, 2020, so that then-President Trump could have a photo op. Okay, so those headlines were all lies, and we now know that to be the case. Then there was the Russia bounty story. This was so deeply personal and disgusting. The New York Times reported that Russia had bounties on the heads of American servicemen and women in Afghanistan, and President Trump did nothing about it. That was the reporting. I stood at the podium and I said, this is not verified. There is no consensus on this intelligence. And in fact, there are dissenting views on this intelligence. And I even warned, before buying into a narrative from the New York Times that falsely states something about the president, wait for the facts to come out. They didn't wait. No. Listen to this irony. The current president, Joe Biden, accused Trump of dereliction of duty. How crazy is that now? Because there's one person who engaged in dereliction of duty, and it was President Joe Biden when he left those troops in Afghanistan and left American citizens in Afghanistan. <laughs> President Trump was accused of treason. Uh, New York, this is this, the sickest part of it all to me. The New York Times literally went to gold star families, so families who lost their son or daughter in war, and said to them, convince them that their son or daughter might have died because President Trump didn't take action. How sick is that? I mean, you think of the pain of a gold star family. I can't imagine losing a child. And then you're told that it was preventable, possibly, and it was all a lie. The entire story was a lie. And we know the story was a lie because 10 months later, Biden's intelligence community, Biden's intelligence community found this. This is the left-wing Daily Beast. U.S. intelligence walks back claim that Russians put bounties on American troops. It was a huge election time story that prompted cries of treason, but according to a newly disclosed assessment, Donald Trump might have been right to call it a hoax. It was all a lie. Yeah.
Then you go to the COVID lab leak. I'll never forget President Trump saying, hey, so COVID-19 coronavirus may have originated in the lab in Wuhan where they're working on coronavirus. Makes a whole lot of sense, right? Uh, well, not to the press. USA Today said Trump says U.S. investigating whether coronavirus spread after China lab mishap, but cites no evidence. NPR, scientists, NPR actually said this, debunk the lab accident theory of pandemic emergence. Washington Post fact checker, was the new coronavirus accidentally released from a Wuhan lab? It's doubtful. And there was CNN, Anthony Fauci just crushed Donald Trump's theory on the origins of the coronavirus. Oh wait, one year later, one year later, Washington Post, how the Wuhan lab leak theory suddenly became credible. Are you sensing a pattern here? All of these lies from the press have been categorically debunked many months later. But where are the firings of the press? Where are the changed headlines? Where is the accountability? It does not exist. But look, at Young Women Leadership Summit, I had a, a woman come up to me, and a young girl, and she said to me, it's hard to feel optimistic. Like that, those are all problems. Those are all you know, ter terrible things. But you know, what, if, what should give me optimism for the way forward? Um, and there's great cause for optimism. And here's why: the media has been exposed. If you look at the polling, Axios in January of this year found that for the first time ever in Edelman Trust Barometer history, fewer than half of all Americans have trust in traditional media. Get this: this is pretty eye-opening. Fifty-six percent of Americans agree with the statement that journalists and reporters are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know to be false or grossly exaggerated. Six, Fifty-six percent, that's a big number. And out of 46 countries surveyed for trust in press, guess where the United States ranks? Dead last. People are waking up, they see it. And they see it when you look at the polling. Quinnipiac's a left-wing polling organization, far left-wing polling organization. And one of my favorite things to do is keep track of their polls that show the crumbling Biden presidency. And I have a little notebook, and every time the Quinnipiac poll comes out, I get to cross out the number, and it goes a few numbers lower. So I just cross them out, cross them out, and you can literally see Joe Biden's presidency just going whoosh. Um, and here, Here's the numbers, and it's bad for our country. Let me be clear about that. It's bad for our country. We want this country to succeed no matter who is president. It's a travesty to watch, but it's encouraging to see that the American people are recognizing that he is directly corresponding to the problems that we face. So the numbers are in from left-wing Quinnipiac. 50% disapprove of Biden's COVID response. 59% disapprove of Biden's economy. 58% disapprove of Biden's foreign policy. 65% disapprove of Biden's handling of Afghanistan. 67% disapprove of Biden's handling of the border crisis. And overall, just 36% approve of the Biden presidency. Wow, that is enormous. But look, we need you. I was just a young girl with a lot of passion. I rode in my dad's truck, listened to the late, great Rush Limbaugh. I was a Rush baby. Rush Limbaugh informed my entire political compass. And then I grew up in the, the pews of my local Southern Baptist church. And that's where I learned something greater than political truth. And it is the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. But I took truth and I turned it into action. And I am so encouraged that I hear from you all and hear what you're doing on your campuses because you're doing just the same. Uh, because we're at a crossroads. Never before have we been at a place like this where our police officers are absolutely demonized. I remember riding through the streets of DC and seeing ACAB spray painted all across the city on the Veterans Affairs sign. ACAB, all cops are, and I won't say that horrible word, but they're under attack. Uh, socialism is quietly creeping through the halls of Congress. That's exactly what the Build Back Better plan would have done. Uh, but it's a scary place. Anti-Semitism, some of the things I've heard from Democratic Congresswomen, anti-Semitic remarks from the squad and the like, uh, it's reprehensible. 
And then there's Afghanistan. I've always said this was a turning point for this president, for this country, and indeed it was. The polling bears it out. But we used to uh, not call the Taliban our Afghan partners. They're not partners. They hang innocent people in the streets. They are not, quote, our partners, as they've been described. Um, we used to believe in leave no man behind. We left a lot of men and women behind in Afghanistan, a lot. And then 13 beautiful servicemen and women, our heroes, were put in a situation they should have never been in at Kabul airport, and they gave their lives. And they shouldn't have had to do that, but they gave their lives heroically because American troops and soldiers always rise to the occasion, and they certainly did. And then our nation's greatest symbols are under attack. Um, you know, it began with the tearing down of monuments, but it ended with a church that was burning. I'll never forget, 10.30 p.m., St. John's Church lit a blaze. I didn't believe it until I turned on the TV and saw it with my own eyes. St. John's Church, a historic, beautiful, little yellow church across from the White House. I passed it each and every day. It was built in 1815. It was called the Church of the Presidents because every president from James Madison on down had attended a service at this historic church. Um, on top of the church is a 1,000-pound bell uh, made by Paul Revere's son. Well, that church was lit ablaze. So as I'm watching this, I'm press secretary at the time, I thought to myself, what's the history behind this church? I want to know a little bit more about it. And here's what I found, and there's irony here, because these rioters who burned that church um, purportedly were doing so on behalf of equal rights. Well, here's the history of the church. 1963, St. John's rector was Reverend John C. Harper. He was told to shut the doors of the church. Why? He was told that there would be a bloodbath. That bloodbath, uh, that was the prediction, ended up being the March on Washington, the biggest peaceful march on behalf of equal rights, the one ending with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and his beautiful I Have a Dream speech. Well, this reverend at this church refused to close the doors. And as the March on Washington was happening, he said this, our family on earth are we throughout its wide, widest span. Oh, help us everywhere to see the brotherhood of man. Those were the lyrics coming from the church. And when Harper was asked, why didn't you shut the doors of the church? He said this, this church building is open as it has always been to any who want to worship here. The ministry of this parish is extended to any who seek it. Our fellowship with one another has no limitations whatsoever. So the church that stood boldly on behalf of civil rights was the church that was lit ablaze purportedly by rioters seeking equal rights. Our nation's churches are under attack. Our American flag is under attack. When you have a New York Times editorial board member said she was disturbed to see the American flag. Macy Gray called it tattered, divisive, and incorrect. The LM Utah called it a symbol of hatred. The US Olympic Committee apparently has plans to redesign the flag, isn't that nice? And then there was an alternate in the Olympics who said she dreamed of getting a medal so she could stand on the podium and not put that American flag around her shoulders, but so that she could burn it. Our nation's symbols are under attack, which is why we need you. Because look, they're trying to silence you. They're trying to take your voice, but you cannot let them. Because I'll tell you this, the same way my dad, who by the way, dad, if you're listening, why don't you come out here? We're gonna do an Instagram Live. My dad and my daughter, baby Blake. My mom's here, but she's shy. So dad, where are you, dad? Where is Hunter? <laughs> awesome. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And I'm not, I'm not texting. I'm on Instagram live right here. Oh, Emma, my cousin. Oh, this is baby Blake. Do you have a message for the Eagles? Oh, man, we, you give us old birds so much hope, guys, I'm telling you. We love you guys. You keep it up, man. You give, you give America, us old guys, we get faith now. We know we got good people coming behind us. Yes. <laughs> My cousin Emma. Well, we are on, we're on Instagram Live, but I wanted to share with you, the same way my dad said I was made for such a time as this, you were made for such a time as this. Come on, baby Blake. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you so much for having me. Baby Blake says hi. <laughs> Have a good one. Give it up.
up for Kaylee one more time. That was awesome. So everybody, that's that's a wrap, everybody. If you are not yet involved with the Turning Point USA chapter, you guys have got to start a chapter, high school and college chapters, church chapters, and get involved with what we're doing at Turning Point USA. You are just part of something so significant and historic. How you doing, Cody? Good to see you, man. So many great patriots in this room. Make sure you support our sponsors one last time on your way out. They help make this event possible and help make these student tickets possible. So help our sponsors on the way out. And if you're not yet involved with Turning Point USA, everybody, tpusa.com, watching on the live stream, start a chapter. We're going to take this country back. See you guys next year. God bless you guys. I'm rolling on like a rolling stone Sing song when I'm walking home Jump up to the top of the brown Ding dong, call me on my phone Nice tea and I'll get my ping pong